all please stand. Almighty God, we the representatives of the citizens of the City of Brisbane are assembled here to strive and care for the welfare of our city and all its people. Uh, Lord, we ask that you guide us in the decisions we make today. Amen. We acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet and pay our respects to elders past and present. Please be seated. I declare the meeting open and welcome you all back. I remind all councillors of your obligations to declare material personal interests and conflicts of interests where relevant and the requirement of such to remove yourself from the council chamber for debate and voting where applicable. Councillors, are there any apologies? Councillor Richards. Uh, Mr Chair, I advise that Councillor Burke and Councillor Mark will be absent today and I move that they be granted a leave of absence from the meeting. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Richards, seconded by Councillor Davis, that Councillors Burke and Marks be granted a leave of absence from today's meeting. All those in favour say aye. Aye. And the contrary, no. The ayes have it. A confirmation of minutes, please. Uh, Mr Chair, I move that the minutes of the 4,603rd meeting held on Tuesday the 10th of September 2019 be received, taken as read and confirmed. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Richards, seconded by Councillor Davis, that the minutes of the 4,603rd meeting of Council held on the 10th of September 2019 be received, taken as read and confirmed. All those in favour say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. Councillors, I draw to your attention uh, the item on the agenda for a public participation. I'd like to invite Ms Laurel Silviera, uh, who will address us uh, on the Food Bank Queensland's Morningside operation. Welcome, Ms Silvera. Uh, you have five minutes, which begins when you begin, and that and Billy's going to start that timer just on your left there, and that'll help you know when that five minutes is up. Lovely. Please proceed when you're ready. Thank you. Uh, Mr Chair, Lord Mayor and councillors, thank you so much for having me here today to let me talk to you about Food Bank Queensland. Food Bank is Australia's largest food relief charity, and in Queensland we rescue and divert the largest amount of food and groceries, edible food and groceries I should say, from landfill and into people's homes who need it. We also purchase um, about a million kilos of food to supplement that 11.8 million kilos that we rescue and divert from landfill. We purchase a million kilos of what we would consider to be pantry staples, and we make that available to charities all across, all across the state. But 53% of the charities that we help are actually located in the Brisbane City Council area. That means the Brisbane City catchment area is the largest that we support at Food Bank Queensland, with a total of 133 charities that we help feed 19,760 people per week. Late October will be rice raising as due to the drought. We've been advised our rice donations will be significantly down and we'll need to fund the additional purchase of this universal food staple to make sure we have it in supply for all of our charities. A big thank you to councillors Cook, Cumming, Adams, Strunk and Davis who've already expressed an interest in helping us to do this. But today I'd like to talk to you about the Food Bank Hunger Report, which shows women are far more likely to have experienced food insecurity than men. More than half of these women have experienced domestic violence, financial violence, or extended periods of single parenting. They're also more likely to have suffered from anxiety and stress. Perhaps Food Bank Queensland can help Brisbane City Council's upcoming citywide domestic violence strategy and play a role in helping to deliver that. Not being able to afford food takes a significant toll, not just on people's physical health. It can also have a devastating impact on their psychological health, um, health as well. Australians struggling with food insecurity are much more likely to experience high or very high levels of psychological distress. And for females, they're twice as likely to feel like a bad parent when there isn't enough food in the house. And when women are impacted by food insecurity, that impacts children as well. 
We know from speaking to our member charities that it's often families that we're helping to feed or provide grocery items to. Now, some of these charities are big, some of them are small, and they all come to our Morningside warehouse in different vehicles. Some come in trucks, some come in utes, some come in their very own personal vehicles to pick up food and groceries to take back to their charity, which is doing food relief in their community. One of the things that we would like to ask of you, Lord Mayor, is if you can assist us to be doing direct deliveries to those Brisbane City Council charities so that we can get more food out to people who need it. One of the largest ch challenges facing our charities is actually having chilled or refrigerated uh, facilities to take all the food back, and that is ready-to-eat meals, it's protein, it's milk, it's bread, it's fresh produce. And it's all of those things that they really need. And when they come with their little esky, they have to choose, what are they taking this week? Are they going to take milk? Are they going to take frozen food? Or are they going to take fresh produce? We would like to be able to deliver to these charities more of our ready-to-eat meals, which we make in partnership with Fair Share. Fair Share are Australia's largest charity kitchen, and since we've partnered with them, we're able to divert our oversupply of fresh produce and send it straight to their kitchen for it to be turned into ready-to-eat nutritious meals. Thank you very much for having me today in Council to speak to you. Thank, no, thank you. you. Thank you, Ms Silvera, for coming in. Um, Councillor Maddock, uh, would you care to respond, please? Uh, thank you, Mr Chair, and thank you, Ms Silvera, for coming in today. And thank you for the enormous contribution that you and your organisation provide. Uh, Food Bank is such a vital part of our community, and what you do day in, day out to help so many needy people is absolutely essential in being able to, to, to contribute to the very fabric of our city. Um, it's very informative, but also equally concerning to hear the kind of results that you received in your report around the growing need around uh, food supply and safety for people, particularly uh, women in, in very difficult, emotional and disadvantaged positions. Um, from a council perspective, we absolutely understand the growing need out there in regards to the areas of rough sleeping, but also, around, unfortunately, the area of homelessness as well. Lord Mayor recently uh, pro announced a grant program uh, providing up to $100,000 over a three-year period to organisations that are providing outcomes uh, in the areas of homelessness and in pathways leading out to homelessness. And I'd certainly encourage yourself and your organisation to perhaps consider that grant application and see whether there are opportunities there where we might find the ability to partner with each other to get even better outcomes. Those grants close in December, so there's still the opportunity there to do that. Um, I certainly uh, thank you very much also for your work with councillors in this chamber uh, in partnering together with them as not only collection points, but also the opportunities that they might be able to provide uh, through their, uh, improvement, their suburban improvement fund uh, around uh, uh, a financial contribution towards offsetting the cost, for example, uh, around the purchase of rice, which I know that is, uh, particularly with the drought at the moment, becomes an even more challenging space. So um, I certainly encourage all councillors to participate in this program if you haven't already. Uh, and I would appreciate the opportunity in due course if we contact your office to see what other opportunities might exist uh, for us to assist you in the work that you do and how we might be able to partner with you to provide even better outcomes for all our Brisbane residents. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr Piers will assist you. Uh, councillors, I would like to now call on Mr uh, Mikko Makalainen, who will address the Chamber on Sustainable Development in Brisbane. Welcome, Mr Makalainen. You may stand or sit, whichever is your preference. Uh, you have five minutes, which commences when you begin. Uh, uh, Mr Piers will help you with your timer, which is on your left, and please begin at your convenience. Thank you, Mr Chair, Lord Mayor and councillors. Um, I'll stand because you probably won't see me if I sit. Uh, my background is that I have worked in the law and I do small development now, and I also work two days a week in city care, which deals with domestic violence and also 
we work in schools that are marginalised and have issues with the young people. Now, in relation to sustainability, the experiences I've had in, in living in Osaka, visiting cities like Mumbai, um, New York, other cities, is that I've come to the conclusion that density is good. There's a, various reasons for it, and I've seen that the council has been shifting towards lower density in relation to car parking, perhaps a livable city. I have no objection to li livable city. I love the fact that we've got bikeways, we've got busways, river walks, great parks. These have been excellent initiatives. I use the bikeways constantly. The um, small residential developers like us, however, are facing challenges. I think that sustainability in relation to, for instance, transport is a high cost. We've got Ripley, North Lakes, Springfield, where we've had to build two rails, one at $1.27 billion and another at $1.267 billion. Should we have actually built high density, low cost public housing? I'm talking public housing for people who are on a lower income or a middle income at a lower rent, rented for 20 years, 30 years. The environment. I think that um, the environment has suffered from expansion. Regrettably, I bought a house in Rochdale, in the old farming area. Regrettably, I feel a bit guilty about it sometimes. What if we would have built high density, high rise, had a rapid feeder service to the Eight Mile Plains bus station? kept the farmland, sold the produce to the supermarkets in those small high density developments. What a way to go. The economic cost is very large to the community in expansion. I mentioned the rails. For us as a small developer, there have been developments, for instance, in the two, three-storey zone, council says you can't build three-storey unless you're so many metres from a railway station. In relation to that, we have large developers building larger developments around railway stations. We can't actually now afford to build the smaller developments that many, many people desire, that may be three-storey in an area that the community says, and maybe council says, three storeys too high. We are actually being squeezed out. We haven't purchased land for three years because of the cost to us. So the community expectation in, in expansion is that they have a big yard and the land is actually not utilised. It sits there, it gets mowed every two weeks, every four weeks perhaps but underutilised. We could utilise it for living space. Not housing cars, not shelter for cars, shelter for people. I think we should reduce shelter for cars. Mexico City has recently gone the way of actually having a cap for car parking. They are saying you can have this many, but you don't have to build any if you don't wish. That's not a bad idea. Oslo, London, few other progressive cities are restricting the amount of car parks. In fact, Japan is a user pay system. Wherever you go, you pay for car parking. People don't like parking meters. I actually think they're a good idea these days. Keeps cars off the streets because they don't want to pay. Should we use public land for car parking? Should we use streets for car parking? It will possibly make people have one car instead of three, a camper trailer and a big four-wheel drive. I know in Kuparu, where I live, used to live just until recently, one of the residents had a camper trailer, had a large camper, two motorbikes and another vehicle. 
They stored their gym equipment in the garage and the others were kept outside. Um, I'm not sure it's a good Mr. idea. Mr McElhannon, disappointingly, your time has expired. Thank you. I've, I think I've had my point anyway. Thank you for no, everyone please, for listening. Please take a seat and we'll arrange for a formal response. Councillor Toomey? Yep, Councillor mm -hmm. Toomey, please. Thank you, Mr Macklin. Thank you for coming in today and raising your concerns around density uh, and sustainability within Brisbane. Uh, you and I have met on a number of occasions. I have to apologise. I don't remember the first time we met, but I do know we shared a table at the Intergenerational Forum, and I do recall our conversation being quite a uh, healthy one. So I, I thank you for your participation in the planning process. Uh, last year, to address uh, some of what you've spoken about, Council conducted a Plan Your Brisbane, which was the largest community engagement exercise ever undertaken uh, in Australia. At that time, uh, we took submissions from over 100,000 uh, people that provided feedback, and the outcome from that was uh, eight principles with 40 action points, some of which you've raised uh, this afternoon. From those action points, uh, we are aware that our city is, is growing. Uh, we've been advised or we've been told to expect uh, 386,000 residents uh, in Brisbane by 2041. Uh, and to accommodate that, we need to find accommodation for 188,000 dwellings by the, by the same time. So with that, we've gone through that exercise. Uh, we've set a number of action points in place, action points which address car sharing uh, to reduce the number of cars on the road. We've also introducing amendments to our Planning Act that introduce additional green space, rooftop gardens, for example. Uh, and we've also got another other amendments that are coming through. I would like to hear what what else you had to say with, uh, within your, your speech this afternoon, and I'm more than happy to meet you outside the chamber uh, where I can take your feedback on board and um, look forward to having a good, robust chat about sustainability in Brisbane moving forward. Thank you for coming in this afternoon. Thank you. Mr McElhane and uh, Mr Pease will look after you. Point of order, Mr Chair. A point of order to you, Lord Mayor. I move a suspension of standing rules to allow me to move an urgency motion in relation to the concerning and inappropriate comments made by Councillor Shree over the weekend. I have a um, seconded. Seconded. I have a urgency motion uh, from the Lord Mayor, uh, Lord Mayor, and a seconded by the Deputy Mayor. Lord Mayor, you have three minutes to establish urgency. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. In public life, you hear a lot of things said. Uh, which you might not agree with. Um, but there are some times when people in public office really do cross the line. And I believe that happened uh, over the weekend uh, with Councillor Shree's comments about the Queensland Police Service. Uh, the comments that Councillor Shree makes on a regular basis about many things, uh, I may not agree with them, but he's got a right uh, to express his opinion. But what we saw on the weekend was the labelling of an entire organisation and the men and women that work for that organisation uh, as violent and racist. Now, the Queensland Police Service is an organisation uh, with a large number of people. I understand Lord, Mayor, more can than I just ask you to can I draw your attention to the yep. matter of urgency as why the matter Thank must you, be dealt Mr. with Chair. now uh, rather than the substantial yep. materiality uh, urgency, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have been contacted uh, in recent days by many members of the public that are concerned that these comments made by Councillor Shree represent the views of Brisbane City Council or Brisbane City Councillors. It is absolutely essential that we immediately place on the record the views of this chamber uh, to make it clear that we do not support the views of Councillor Shree as an organisation or as a group of councillors, to make it clear that these comments are Councillor Shree's and Councillor Shree's alone, but not representing the Brisbane City Council, the councillors, the Lord Mayor, and in fact, the many staff that work for Brisbane City Council. It is vital that we uh, make this very clear on the public record and, in fact, uh, defend uh, the people of the Queensland Police Service. Uh, so, Mr Chair, I would hereby move 
that this council declares its support for the Queensland Police Service and acknowledges its vitally important role in upholding the law and keeping our community safe. We thank the men and women of the QPS who work around the clock, often in demanding and dangerous situations, to faithfully fulfil their duties in service of, uh, to the community. We condemn the damning comments made by Councillor Shree over the weekend, branding QPS as violent and racist, and we call on Councillor Shree to withdraw his comments. Seconded. Seconded. Thank you. I have um, an urgency motion. The substantial motion has also been read. I will now, to the matter of urgency, all those who feel this matter is urgent, say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. Uh, the ayes have it. Lord Mayor, uh, do you have a, a notice of your reading? Would I be able to have a copy of that? Thank you. Lord Mayor, to the substantial motion, please. Thank you, uh, Mr Chair. The motion is being distributed uh, so that its wording uh, is given to all councillors. Mr Chair, as I was saying, there is uh, very much uh, of a room in this democratic society that we live for differences of opinion, uh, and that is part of a healthy democracy. Uh, but as I said, there are some times when those comments cross the line, uh, and it is important that this organisation makes it very clear that we do not support Councillor Shree's comments, and that we in fact support the men and women of the Queensland Police Service. The role of this organisation in our community, which is an important uh, organisation for maintaining law and order, uh, and in fact the uh, work of so many officers uh, in the police service who uh, dedicate their time day and night, put themselves often uh, in the path of danger and often are injured or even killed uh, in performing their duties. Now, like any large organisation, I understand the police service has more than 11,000 officers. There are always people who may do the wrong thing. And as I said, that is the case for any organisation. But to brand an entire organisation in this way is completely offensive and inappropriate, uh, and it is something that uh, we as an organisation should not tolerate, uh, and we should, uh, in fact, call on Councillor Shree to withdraw those comments. The police, they do this job out of a sense of service to our community. Councillor Shree's branding of them as racist and violent uh, really does an incredible disservice to the men and women uh, that work to keep us safe. All of this came uh, very clear to me uh, a couple of months ago when uh, I was here in City Hall uh, together with the Royal Humane Society of uh, Australia, presenting with that society the annual awards for bravery. Now, those awards are open to uh, any member of the community who has put themselves in danger and potentially sacrificed or been willing to sacrifice their own safety in saving someone else. But almost all of those award recipients were members of our emergency services, and many of them were police officers. And to hear the stories of people literally forsaking their own safety, their personal safety, going out on a limb for other people to help them, to save them. Uh, it, it was incredible, the work that they do. One case that really st stuck in my mind uh, were, was a couple of police officers. It was actually on the Sunshine Coast. A man had swum out into the surf to try and commit suicide. These two police officers, it was a dark night. Uh, there was a strong current. The man was already more than 100 metres out into the water. These two police officers stripped off their clothes, jumped into the water, swam out to save this guy. They were moving further and further away from the shore. The man who was trying to commit suicide tried to uh, take the police officers under with him. He continued to try to take his own life. Uh, these police officers persisted. They rescued that man. They saved that man. Uh, and they were rightly awarded uh, a bravery medal for their efforts. That was just one story of so many on that day. And this was just one year of awards. 
and every year these awards are held. But every day out in the community, police officers work hard to keep us safe. They work hard to uphold the law on our behalf, and they should be commended for that, not condemned or branded as violent and racist. Freedom of speech is important in this democracy, but people should be called out when they say something uh, like Councillor Shree has said. I'm going to leave my comments at that. Further speakers? Councillor Cassidy. Oh, thank you, Chair. Um, I'd just like to request that um, uh, in this motion that the three paragraphs are taken seriatim for voting purposes, and there's a clear precedent yeah, no, that's fine. for that happening. Um, uh, and I just want to put on record um, our support for the Queensland Police Service and certainly agree with the sentiments uh, in this motion. Um, we know that, um, and I'm sure all of uh, my colleagues here have a very close working relationship with um, local um, uh, police stations and uh, police officers in our local community and understand those challenges they face on the front line. And I certainly do have a very close working relationship uh, with those stations at Boondal uh, and at Sandgate and appreciate the work that they do. Uh, but um, I also note that this is a, uh, a place where we are elected by the community. Uh, we are democratically elected councillors uh, and are able uh, in a democracy here in Brisbane uh, to espouse views, views that some people don't necessarily agree with, and it's quite clear that the, um, uh, the Lord Mayor uh, doesn't agree with the views of Councillor Shri, and, and neither do I. However, I do think he has a right to make them, and uh, I think he made pretty clear from the reporting that I saw that they were his personal views, not the views of Council as a whole. Uh, and so I certainly don't share those views, but uh, he is entitled um, uh, to make those views known. Uh, we are not uh, in, in a city or a state or a country uh, where uh, our governments come down heavy on us, uh, like we're seeing uh, around the world, whether it's in Hong Kong uh, or in Ecuador uh, this week, where 180 people were shot dead. Uh, we are able to make those views that we hold um, clear in a safe environment here, we think. Uh, so we will certainly um, show our support for the Queensland Police Service, uh, but also think that uh, if those personal views of an individual are those personal views, uh, then uh, it is up to that person to make them. Yes. Speakers, Councillor Owen. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Mr Chairman, I rise this afternoon in support of this motion, and can I start my comments with the words, with honour, they serve. This is the motto of the Queensland Police Service, and I believe that all police officers go into the job and deal with their daily requirements with honour through their service. Can I also say that all frontline emergency services should be thanked for their service to our community, not subjected to unsubstantiated slurs. I would like to acknowledge at the outset the many Queensland Police Service officers whose names are on the police memorial, including two officers who I knew personally, Daniel Arthur Stiller and Damien Leading. Dan did a lot of work in community road safety and was dedicated in that way. And this council has dedicated an environmental corridor in his honour for the work that he did in our local community. Damien Leading was based down the Gold Coast and was unfortunately killed during an armed robbery. The ramifications of what Queensland Police Service officers do on a daily basis is that they put themselves in harm's way so that we as a community, so that we as a city remain safe. And I, on behalf of my community, thank them for their service. I know how hard the Queensland Police Service worked in conjunction with the Queensland Fire and Emergency Service and the Queensland Ambulance Service and the SES dur during the 2011 floods to keep people safe. I know how locally 
It impacted Queensland Police Service officers who attended a murder of a baby in my community and how one officer worked extremely hard to try to keep that baby alive and how another police officer stayed with that baby through the entire autopsy process because he could not bear the thought of that child being alone, being a father to young children himself. I know how it impacts the police officers who attend fatalities on our roads, and in particular, the, the impact that a fatal of a young child on Paradise Road really resonated. And, and certainly, we've had a recent road fatality in Parkinson. I know how hard my local police worked when we had a man streaking through one of our council parks in close proximity to two local schools. And yes, they did apprehend him through a lot of dedicated police work. I know how they deal with difficult domestic violence situations in our community every single day. I know that the Queensland Police Service officers are not violent. They are not racist. And it is certainly not something that you can label an organisation as a whole. The Queensland Police Service has a process that is open and transparent, and they have an ethical standards unit. And certainly, where there is concern about particular standards being upheld, they are reported publicly. In the southern region of the Queensland Police Service here in Brisbane, who I have worked closely with for many, many, many years, I know that they have been focused on working with the many cultures that live in our southern region. I have worked closely with the many police liaison officers they are about working to bridge the gap, working with the migrant communities who have a fear of police. They want the migrant communities to understand that the police here in Queensland work with people to make sure that they have a safe community to live in, to work in, to relax in and to raise their family. I know that through the many citizenship ceremonies that I have been presiding officer for in my ward, that the Queensland Police have always, always attended to make sure our new citizens feel welcome in our city and in our local community. The Queensland Police Service work closely with me in many events to make sure that young people and families can come to council-funded events in a safe way. In regards to the comments that have been made over the weekend, they are not the reflection of councillors in the Shrinner team. I feel that those, those comments should be withdrawn because they do not reflect all Queensland police officers. They do not reflect that organisation as a whole. And I personally feel that the councillor who made those comments should be making an apology to the 147 families who who, of the police officers whose names are listed on that police memorial down in the Botanic Gardens, those police officers who have paid the ultimate sacrifice for their service to keeping our community safe. So that apology needs to not be made to the councillors in this chamber. It needs to be made to the families and colleagues of those 147 fallen officers and to all police officers in this state. I will conclude my comments today with the same comments that I made at the beginning. And to all the police, Queensland Police Service officers, I know that is, with honour, 
they serve. Yeah. Further speakers? Councillor Johnston. Yes, just briefly to the actual urgency motion. Um, let, I read this over the weekend um, and I also took the opportunity to speak to Councillor Shri about it today. Um, to me, and he knows my views about it, um, to me, this Lord Mayor is simply trying to raise a political point here and do some cheap political point scoring um, with this motion. Uh, he has avenues available to him uh, to take action if he is unhappy with what Councillor Shri has said. Having said that, um, I certainly want to, uh, re, uh, to uh, support the idea that the Queensland Police Service play a valuable role in our community. I don't agree with everything that they do. Um, I know that they do their best as an organisation, um, and we are very lucky to have such a good police service. That is not to say that there have not been historic and ongoing problems within the police force. Um, Indigenous deaths in custody and the corruption era of Queensland Police is, is a significant blight on the history of our police force. Um, but I agree with what the Lord Mayor said, um, that these instances now appear to be not systemic, uh, they are isolated incidences of inappropriate or bad behaviour by particular police, and it is inappropriate, in my view, um, to uh, declare a whole organisation uh, in a particular way. So I certainly don't agree with Councillor Shree's comments. I spoke to him about it. Um, I, I don't think they should have been said, but they're not my comments, they're his. They are his responsibility, and all the things that will flow from them are a matter for him uh, to address. Um, so I'm more than happy to put on the record my support for the Queensland um, Police Service. Um, I certainly um, uh, don't want to politically pile on to something I think was wrong myself um, and set a precedent in this place. Um, there are appropriate forums for this matter to be addressed, and in my view, we should be debating the business of the city now, um, not a politically motivated motion like this one. Further speakers? Councillor Shree. Thanks, Mr Chair. I rise to speak on the motion before us. Um, I must say that while I'm, I'm not going to speak as to the, the motivations behind why the motiva motion's been brought in this manner, um, I think it is actually an important conversation for the city to have. Um, I disagree slightly with Councillor Johnston in that even though this council doesn't directly manage and control the police force, I think where the community is raising serious repeated allegations and, and concerns about any organisation that operates within our city, it's appropriate for council to be discussing that matter and to um, be making statements and forming views on such issues. Um, I'm not surprised that my comments have offended um, a lot of members of the public, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be discussing this important issue. There are really two um, elements of what I've said that the, um, the mayor seems to take issue with. The, First is the suggestion that the police as an institution or organisation are violent. And the second is the um, suggestion that the police as an organisation is racist. Um, I think the first point can actually be dismissed with very little debate in that, of course, the police use force. Of course, the police use violence. That's kind of how they enforce the law. They use violence and the threat of violence on a regular basis in order to control um, members of the public and to ensure compliance with de their directions. Some people might not like recognising that fact, but it is a fact. The police use violence. The police force is thus violent. Now, reasonable people can disagree about whether that force is appropriate or proportional or whether it's directed at the right people at the right times, but it's a matter of fact that the police use violence. And I, I think it's surprising that um, so many members of this chamber seem uncomfortable with recognising that, um, that fact. Perhaps the more interesting question is whether the police force is racist. And what I want to emphasise here is that when I say that an organisation or an institution is racist, I'm not saying that every single individual officer who works for that organisation is racist. I'm certainly not saying that every um, individual police officer is motivated by racism or makes decisions based on, um, co on covert racial bias on a regular basis. Um, I have constructive working relationships with many of the police officers in my electorate, um, and I've found many of them to be very decent people, um, 
who are motivated by good intentions and, and who are on a regular basis try to do the right thing. But when we're assessing whether a particular organisation or system is racist, we shouldn't focus on individuals within that system, but on the results and outcomes of a system as a whole. Now, we know, based on recent census data and statistics released by the state government, that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are roughly 15 times more likely to be incarcerated than non-Indigenous people. 15 times. Now, whichever way you spin it, a system that locks up Aboriginal people at 15 times the rate of non-Indigenous people is a racist system. Now, yes, there are a whole bunch of complex factors behind that. And yes, that's partly the, the fault of the criminal justice system more generally, and I'm happy to say that other parts of the criminal justice system are racist as well. I don't say I'm happy to say it, but I'm willing to acknowledge it. Um, but the police play a big role in that. And that's partly because police um, officers and those directing their resources make decisions to enforce and p police certain kinds of crimes at a higher rate than others. And often those are crimes which, for a range of reasons, might be more likely to occur in certain communities than others. Partly it's because when um, some officers engage in interactions with members of the public, they are motivated by racism at an individual level. Um, and, and partly it's because of the structural biases and disadvantages that influence um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's access to justice and to be treated fairly um, by police both when they're attending on the front line and in later interactions. But the deeper problem here, and the reason I, I stand by my comment that the police force as an institution is racist, is that on multiple occasions in recent history in this state, when individual officers have been found to have engaged in racist, racially motivated behaviour, where they have used disproportionate levels of violent force and have been motivated to do so in part because of the, um, the Aboriginal, Aboriginality of the people they were dealing with. The Queensland Police Force, the Queensland Police Service, sorry, repeatedly lines up to back those officers. Now, it would be a very different thing if an organisation, having realised that members of, it, of its um, staff were, were racist, said, oh, we're letting that person go. They've been They've been fired. In fact, they've used violence without authorisation. We're going to charge those police officers. We're going to hold them accountable. But instead, what happens regularly, time and time and again, is that when police officers are found to use excessive force, when they are found to behave inappropriately, and particularly when they are found to engage in racist behaviour towards Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, and also um, to people of colour from other migrant communities, the Queensland Police Service and the hierarchy, the leadership of the Queensland P Police Service, resists scrutiny, covers up complaints, refuses to release important information that should be in the public record, and fails to properly discipline those officers. So I'm not saying that every single police officer is individually a, a racist person, but what I am saying is that a police service which, when presented with clear examples of racism by its officers, instead of disciplining those officers appropriately and taking the necessary steps to make the cultural changes within that organisation, which are so sorely needed, when that police service instead reinforces and supports that behaviour by failing to appropriately censure those officers, then yes, the police service is racist. So I want to and briefly by reading a media release from May 2018 by the Australian Human Rights Commission. It refers to a, a federal court case where the Federal Court of Australia found that the Queensland Police had been racist. I'll read it um, into the record verbatim because I think it's useful context. This is just one of many examples in our recent past where Queensland Police officers have been found to engage in using disproportionate force, excessive violence, targeted against Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. I'll, re I'll read from the release. In one of the most significant racial discrimination cases in Australia's history, the Queensland Government has agreed to apologise and deliver a $30 million settlement to residents of Palm Island for racial discrimination linked to riots in 2004. The riots took place after the death in custody of local Aboriginal man known as Mulrunji, who died of internal injuries while being held by police. 
The compensation was awarded to 447 Palm Island residents following a class action in the federal court which found that there, were unlawful there was unlawful discrimination in contravention of the Racial Discrimination Act. Quote, this settlement highlights how the Racial Discrimination Act is an instrument of justice. This is good news for the people of Palm Island, and we welcome the Queensland Government's acknowledgement of the pain and suffering of the residents of Palm Island, said Race Discrimination Commissioner Tim Supomasane. The proud residents of Palm Island have demonstrated their resilience, commitment and patience in waiting for their rights and suffering to be acknowledged. It's never too late to be vindicated and, re and receive an apology, but it is a shame that it's taken so long, said Social Justice Commissioner June Oscar Ayo. The Commission hopes this case gives the community an opportunity to heal from the events that took place 14 years ago. The Australian Human Rights Commission has been involved in the events surrounding the case over a number of years. On 19th of November 2004, a 36-year-old Aboriginal man known after his death as Mulringi died in police custody on Palm Island. His death was investigated by the Queensland Police Service. A week after his death, there were protests on Palm Island. A number of people were charged with criminal offences. In 2005, the Commission was granted leave to appear at a coronial inquest into the death of Mulrungi. The coroner adopted all 40 of the recommendations in the Commission's submission to the inquest. In 2010, a group of Palm Island residents made a complaint to the Commission about the role played by the Queensland Police Service in investigating the death of Mulrungi in managing community concerns on the island in the week after his death and in their response to the protests. The applicants claim that the police officers conducted themselves differently because they were dealing with an Aboriginal community and the death of an Aboriginal man. The banner could not be resolved by conciliation and the complainants commenced a class action proceeding in the federal court. In December 2016, Justice Mortimer in the federal court found that there had been breaches of the Racial Discrimination Act. Her Honour found that QPS officers with command and control of the investigation did not act impartially and independently and that there were substantial failures by officers to communicate with the Palm Island community and diffuse tensions prior to the protests. Significantly, Her Honour found that the police response to the protests was excessive and disproportionate. Mass officers of the Special Emergency Response Team broke into the houses of 18 families on Palm Island with assault rifles and confronted unarmed local men, women and children. Her Honour found that the police acted in these ways because they were dealing with an Aboriginal community and with the, death, with the community of Palm Island in particular. The court made declarations that the Racial Discrimination Act had Councilor been breached Green. and Councilor awarded members, damages to members of the Watton family. Further speakers? Councillor Adams. Thank you, Mr Chair, and I stand to support the motion that we have before us this afternoon. And I think what we just heard from Councillor Shree is the actual confirmation that Councillor Shree lacks the basic understanding of what it means to represent your local community as a Brisbane City Council councillor. We have often said that Councillor Shree is in the wrong level of government, and we have seen this time and time again, and nothing more than the 10 minutes of digging the hole deeper than we just heard then. Councillors, Councillor Johnston, Councillors, this uh, debate has been conducted exceptionally respectfully, and I'd ask that, to, that, that that continue, please. Councillor Adams. Thank you. This motion is about condemning Councillor Shree for his branding of the QPS as violent and racist, and that's exactly what I'm speaking about, Councillor Johnson. He sides with fringe groups like Extinction Rebellion and would rather protest to peddle his own extreme ideology than do his job as a local councillor. His comments over the weekend, we've heard many comments over the last three and three quarter years, but his comments over the weekend took it up a notch. What we saw over the weekend is that he does not have the integrity to drill down on an issue. He pulled out his broad brush and he just did it again then. And I do not agree with what he just said. He painted the whole Queensland Police Service as violent and racist organisation. He quotes one-off issues that are dealt with on individual basis to paint 15,000 hard-working officers in Queensland as violent and racist, including Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander recruits that work within the QPS, including our community liaison officers. These comments are at best misguided, but in reality they are completely abhorrent. Congratulations, Councillor. You have just demonstrated bigotry in its most basic form.
The ex-man across here has called the QPS violent and racist, and I'm not allowed to call him a bigot. Deputy Mayor, please stick to the material. I know for a fact that my local station at Holland Park are neither racist nor violent. They are a terrific station that is staffed by men and women completely dedicated to keeping our area safe. They are underfunded by the Palaszczuk government, but they are committed nonetheless. They work across this city and indeed the state, Look, focused point, on tackling point crime, putting criminals away, and now apparently that is some sort of crime itself. Point of order. A uh, point of order, Councillor Johnston. Uh, yes. Um, look, as much as I don't like what Councillor Shri has said, I don't feel that um, calling another councillor a bigot in this place is appropriate, and I believe that is um, an offence under our standing orders. And I was hoping that you would voluntarily address it, Mr. Chairman. But as you're, you're not, um, I feel that that comment. Um, if Councillor Shri had said what he'd said in here, he'd be in trouble, um, and I don't believe that um, describing him in such a way uh, is appropriate yeah, no, under you, our Councilor standing Johnson, order. I appreciate your point. Um, Deputy Mayor, uh, can I ask you to consider withdrawing that and finding a more proportional term? I will clarify what I said. He demonstrated bigotry. I did not call Councillor Shri a bigot. The Hansard will show yeah, okay. right. that my comment was he demonstrated bigotry in its most basic uh, form? I, as, I say, as I say, please, um, up in th this, this debate is sensitive. Um, it's been conducted uh, very respectfully so far. Um, I ask that we all keep a sense of proportion in the debate. Deputy Mayor. Thank you. And the violent and racist comments were added to by his Facebook quotes on the weekend <coughs> that the QPS was a immoral and unjust service and that anyone who signs up to the QPS does so without personal consideration. That in itself is an extreme case of imputing motive to our Queensland Police Service. They are Point focused order, on Mr. a Chair. civil society. Point of order, Councillor Shree. I'm, I'm just concerned about the fact that the um, Deputy Mayor might be paraphrasing and, taking co and misinterpreting comments, so I'd ask that the Deputy Mayor either quote directly or do not attribute statements to me. All right. Well, that's not really a point of order, but I, I appreciate it. As I say, what I will say on that matter is that I ask, is that, I ask that all councillors continue conducting themselves to a very high level and please be considerate of others and be proportional in their statements. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr Point of Chair. order, Mr Chairman. Point of order, Councillor Johnston. Yes. Uh, look, Mr Chairman, I think um, possibly one of the outcomes of all of this is uh, that some of these statements may be considered by others as defamatory, and by giving them oxygen in this place, as the Deputy Chairman is doing, um, we may uh, be creating a problem for ourselves that is unnecessary. So I draw your attention to the issue about defamation and your obligations as the Chairman to deal with matters so that we don't have a problem arising from it being aired in Council's I understand chamber. what you're saying, and, and the point you're attempting to make is that no one in this place has privilege and everybody is accountable for their personal statements, not the institution, yourselves. All right, and I will remind everybody of that obligation. Um, the obligation is to yourself. You have indemnified this organisation from the things that you say, so each individual is responsible. Deputy Mayor. I will, I will clarify and I will read word for word. Yes, you might happen to know a nice person with good intention who works as a police officer, but these people have signed up, even sworn an oath, to enforce laws passed by corrupt politicians and to use violence to enforce those laws without questioning orders or thinking for themselves, even when the practical operation of those laws is immoral and unjust. That is word for word from Councillor Shree's Facebook, and that is imputing motive on the 15,000 hard-working Queensland police officers in this state. Councillor Shree needs to get back to taking his residents' phone calls. He needs to quit disrupting the city during peak hour, and he needs to stop labelling everybody he doesn't like as a racist. He calls for participatory democracy, but only if everybody agrees with his policies. He needs to withdraw his comments, apologise, and get back to the job he is paid to do. Further speakers? There being none, Lord Mayor. One of the uh, great things about this job is the opportunity to engage widely across the community, particularly with our multicultural groups. And at countless 
uh, multicultural functions across the city, almost always uh, representatives from the police, Queensland Police Service, police liaison officers, senior officers, making the effort to show up, to engage, to break down barriers, to pro promote tolerance and diversity, and to, and to break any uh, issues that have been there in the past. Now, Councillor Shri made a very clear statement. He said, the Queensland Police Force, and it's not a force, it's a service, is violent and racist. Now, he didn't say that there are elements of history that are violent and racist. He didn't say that the Queensland Police Service has a history that is violent and racist. He didn't say that there are some individuals in the police service that are violent and racist. He labelled the entire organisation in the present tense, mm -hmm. saying it still is, and everyone involved can't think for themselves and have to unthinkingly follow orders. I, I mean, I'm not the only one who can see the problems with these statements and these comments. Now, Councillor Shri is in this place. He's in an elected position. It's a position of responsibility, and it's the position that his residents put him in to do a particular job. And I don't think there were too many of those residents when they voted uh, in Councillor Shri back in 2016, expected that they would get a councillor that would actively disrupt the city, that would actively encourage people to break the law, that would actively label the Queensland Police Service and all of its officers as violent and racist. I'm not sure if they knew what they were getting when they supported Councillor Shri, but the good news is they know what they've got now. And I can tell you there's a lot of people across the community that aren't happy about it. Now, Councillor Shri, like all of us, will face the people next year at the election. But I, have the, I am giving him the opportunity now in this chamber to withdraw those comments. Because Councillor Johnston is right. There are actions that can be taken for comments like this made by elected representatives. Because we are held to a high standard for our public comments, and we are responsible for those comments. Uh, Councillor Shri has the opportunity now to withdraw those comments, uh, but even Councillor Johnston suggested in this place that Councillor Shri's comments were defamatory. Now, I'm not a lawyer, and so I don't know uh, whether that is the case, uh, but I suspect it is. And so there's an opportunity now uh, for Councillor Shri to do the right thing and to either withdraw the statements he's made or even to qualify them, like I suggested. There's various ways those statements could be qualified that may seem more reasonable to people. Uh, but it was a sweeping statement he made right here, right now, affecting every man and woman in the Queensland Police Service. I don't think that's right. I don't think that's fair. And I don't think the majority of Brisbane residents would agree with the claims that Councillor Shri ma has made. I would simply once again ask for Councillor Shree to please consider withdrawing those comments uh, and doing the right thing. Uh, councillors, the resolution comes in three sections. For those who support the first section that begins with the word declares and concludes with community, those who support that say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. Division. Division. Division called by Lord Mayor and Councillor Owen. Eyes to my right, nose to my left. Please ring the bells. seen him. Clarks, please read the result. 
Mr. Chair, the ayes have it. The voting being 23 in favour and one against. Please return to your seats. Um, while you're returning to your seats, I'll take a moment to recognise former Councillor Flesser, who's in the gallery. Welcome back. All right. The second section that begins with the word condemns and concludes with the word racist. Uh, all those in favour say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. No. The ayes have it. Division. Division, Division called by uh, Councillor Murphy and the Deputy Mayor. Ayes to my right, noes to my left. Please ring the bells. Clarks, please read the result. Mr Chair, the ayes have it, the voting being 17 in favour, 6 against and 1 abstention. Thank you. The ayes have it. Please return to your seats. And to the third item that begins with the word further, all those in favour say aye. Aye. And to the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Division. Division called by the Deputy Mayor and Councillor Owen. Eyes to my right, nose to my left. Please ring the bells. Attendants, please close the bars. Clerk, please read the result. Mr Chair, the ayes have it, the voting being 17 in favour, 6 against and 1 abstention. The ayes have it. Please return to your seats. Point of order, Mr Chair. Point of order to you, Lord Mayor. Mr Chair, I move suspension of standing rules to allow me to move an urgency motion in relation to the use of council facilities. Seconded. I have an uh, urgency resolution being moved by the Lord Mayor and seconded by uh, Councillor Maddock. Lord Mayor, um, the, the topic is um, the use of council facilities. Right now, three minutes, and can I stress the three minutes be used to, to uh, demonstrate why this matter is urgent, please? Lord Mayor. P point of order, Mr Chairman. Point of order to you, um, Councillor Johnston. Yes, just so we can understand what the um, request for urgency relates to, can we hear the um, motion that is proposed to be urgent uh, so we can make a decision, please? Um, I trust that the Lord Mayor will make it very clear what it is that he's proposing, uh, and then at the conclusion of his speech, we'll make a consideration about whether it's urgent or not. Um, uh, and I think that that's, a, that, that's something that we've, we've allowed here in this place regularly. Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Chair. Over the Council recess, and obviously we're in the first meeting back from the recess, uh, a number of things happened. Most importantly is that last week we had a week of continuous disruption of our city by extremist protesters. Now, one of the things that people, many people have contacted me about is the fact that this uh, group, Extinction Rebellion, who are arranging the protests and actively disrupting the life of this city, are using council facilities such as libraries to organise their protests and to hold meetings. I have uh, given a commitment to the people of Brisbane and, in fact, to the people that have contacted me that I will urgently review this situation. And so I have had a look at what policies may be in place or what policies may exist on this matter. Now, this is not something that the city has experienced uh, in the past. Uh, this is quite a unique situation. Uh, and certainly the use of council facilities by groups like Extinction Rebellion 
is something that generates a lot of opinion and controversy in the community. And so the motion that I am putting forward today, the urgency motion, uh, deals with this issue decisively and makes it clear what this administration's position is on the use of these facilities. So I move that this council notes councils, facilities, including libraries, are not suitable meeting places for organisations that advocate or incite illegal activities. Further, considers that the Extinction Rebellion organisation falls into this category and disallows them from booking council meeting facilities in the future. Second. All right, to the, to the matter of urgency. Point of order, Mr Chair. Uh, point of order, uh, Councillor Shree. Um, just as the question of whether the motion is valid, because I don't think Extinction Rebellion is a uh, formal no, no, organisation. Uh, Councillor Shree, the motion before us is urgency, and can I ask sure. you to make these comments about the material motion in a moment when that's before us? On the topic of urgency, all those in favour say aye. Aye. The contrary, no. No. The ayes have it. Lord Mayor, I noted that you were reading. I was hoping that I'd be able to be provided a copy of that, and if there is enough copies, that they be distributed to councillors. Uh, thank you. Now, um, Councillor Shree, can I invite your point of order again, please? Thanks, Mr Chair. I don't have the text of the motion before me, but it does refer to the Extinction Rebellion organisation. My understanding is that um, there is no formal organisation and that in, in practical terms, it would actually be quite difficult for this motion to have any effect because there's no entity, legal entity as such that the motion could be directed at. I appreciate the point you're, you're making, but for there to be coordinated events around the world in many Western capitals, there has to be some level of organisation. And so I will allow this to, to proceed on those grounds. Um, Lord Mayor, to your resolution, please. Okay, so just being clear what this is uh, putting forward is that council facilities, including libraries, are not suitable meeting places for organisations that advocate or incite illegal activities. Uh, and also that uh, this council considers that Extinction Rebellion uh, falls into this category and disallows them from booking council meeting facilities in future. Now, um, before anyone um, uh, puts on some mock outrage um, about a new policy. Uh, I refer to this uh, staff only guideline dated the 4th of the 6th, 2018, so last year, April, uh, which talks about uh, booking council meeting facilities and libraries. And in relation to community groups, it says meeting rooms are not suitable for activities which advocate or incite illegal activities such as trespass, vandalism, theft, violence, or hate speech. Uh, and the same applies for other uh, not-for-profit organisations and community groups. Uh, so this is something that in the past, council has had a guideline on. I am simply saying that we should enforce this guideline with the backing of this uh, administration and this council chamber, and that Extinction Rebellion quite clearly fits into that category. Now, not only is Extinction Rebellion uh, causing major, major disruption to the city during peak hours deliberately, uh, they are also encouraging people to break the law. There wouldn't be hundreds of people getting arrested if there wasn't law breaking going on. That is the reality of the situation. I don't think anyone can argue that this group, uh, whether it's a formal group or not, is irrelevant. It is a, an organisation that is organised enough to disrupt the city. Uh, and I think it is time that we make sure that they are not using council facilities to plan their disruption of this city. Once again, I think this is something which the vast majority of Brisbane residents would be supportive of. This is something that I have been contacted by many people about uh, and something that I have agreed uh, to review urgently. Thank you, Mr Chair. 
Further speakers, Councillor Cassidy. Thank you, Chair. What an absolute farce this is. There's nothing urgent about this. The only urgent thing about this motion is March 28 next year. This Lord Mayor is running scared. He says people are running around contacting him about these issues. Well, let me tell you, Chair, what people are contacting me about. It's this Lord Mayor. It's about him trousering $100,000 in cash payments, um, now, unaccountable okay, okay, cash Councilor payments, Councilor payments order. misusing ratepayer funds. Point of order. Point of order, Councillor Howard. But, Relevance. But as, I, as I was going to. Um, um, uh, Councillor Cassidy. Okay, righto. Please, councillors. Um, there's going to be a lot of opportunity for you to make comments like this today, Councillor Cassidy. Um, this really isn't one of them. Can you please um, keep your comments to the matter at hand? And as I say, you'll have many opportunities to make the points you're making, but please refrain from them now and stick to the matter in this, front of us. This motion is a joke and this Lord Mayor is a joke. He's a shell walking around looking for a personality. This Lord Mayor is showing no leadership when it comes to the absolute rorting and misuse Again, of ratepayer funds, Councilor, Chair, Councilor and yet he Cassidy, comes in here with this ridiculous smokescreen. Please stick to whether the Extinction Rebellion organisation can use, should be able to use council facilities or not. What this Lord Mayor shouldn't be able to do is misuse ratepayers' money, Chair. And that's what we should be talking about. We should be talking about this Lord Mayor's okay. misuse well, and Councilor rorting Cassidy, of ratepayers' money. This is an absolute you, you, smoke screen. Cassidy, this is stop. a farce. Right now, I've, I've asked you to come back to the topic at hand three times. Um, very soon, well, actually, we are right on the cusp of this being an act of disorder. Um, please stick, please stick to the matter at hand. Now, I appreciate that it's your first day. I appreciate that there's enthusiasm. Um, that's good, right? But please, as I've said, there's many, many opportunities for you to make these comments. I suspect this meeting will go well past, well into the evening. Can we please just... Can we please just stick to the matters in front of us? So the Lord Councilor Mayor, Cassidy. the Lord Mayor, in, in his opening just just then, did exactly what he just accused Councillor Shree of doing: of painting every single person who participated in any of those activities as lawbreakers, as scum of the earth. Yeah, bigotry. That's right. So what we should be discussing is this Lord Mayor's appalling, appalling track record when it comes to rorts. Uh, but instead, of course, he will do everything, everything he can between now and March 28 next year uh, to distract from the issues that ratepayers out in the suburbs are facing. What two weeks does, it's quite amazing, isn't it, uh, for this Lord Mayor to start chasing his tail uh, and going into a spin. We've got LNP councillors left, right and centre jumping ship, jumping ship. They, they know something's coming. Point of Mr. order, Chair. Mr Chair. Uh, point of order to you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, again, you have called it irrelevant. This is literally not relevant for the fifth time. Again, we can... Uh, I, I do allow a lot of tolerance in the presentations to, to the council, but please, um, but please, uh, councillor, can I ask you one more time to address your comments to the resolution in front of us? Please proceed. Yeah, Chair, this is a farce. All oh, right, okay, you've concluded. All right, um, uh, Councillor Maddock. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair, and I rise in support of this urgency motion by the Lord Mayor. It's disappointing to see um, Councillor Cassidy as Leader of the Opposition in his first time in this chamber to take an important issue around this issue and to then simply dismiss it and then decide that he would rather play the game of politics rather than address the issues that are genuine to our city. Now, when Councillor Cassidy made that spray to the Lord Mayor, he spoke about the Lord Mayor condemning others and calling people names. He did no such thing. What the Lord Mayor spoke about was an issue that is genuine and that has been addressed uh, and raised with him on a number of occasions and that is the resourcing of people who would choose to take the law into their own hands. Mr Chair, nobody says here that we are in any way trying to stifle democracy. In fact, this chamber is a reflection of the importance of democracy, not only in this city but across our state. 
And those people that choose to speak on the issue of climate change should be heard. They should be given the opportunity. And in our libraries, we do. There are many, many organisations that use our meeting spaces within our libraries to exchange ideas and to talk about a better future. And they should be entitled to do so. And all of those organisations enjoy the ability to be able to use those meeting rooms free of charge in order to do that. That's an important part of the service that this council provides to all Brisbane residents and continues to do so. And that's why these guidelines were established. And it's the guidelines that the Lord Mayor has raised today. It is the guidelines that he is concerned about in that organisations such as Extinction Rebellion are utilising for their own means to coordinate their efforts on the streets of our city. Now, we have seen over time these organisations as Extinction Rebellion go out and cause the kind of chaos that they are causing. We have seen the Labor state government put up with it to a certain extent. We have seen the Queensland Police Service put up with it uh, as much as they have, contrary to the kind of point of views that Councillor Shree raised in the previous motion. But, Mr Chair, even the state government is saying enough is enough. This state government is now implementing and introducing new laws in the parliament to address this issue of Extinction Rebellion and the impact that it's having on all Brisbane residents, those that support them and those that do not. And as a council, it's important also that we take those necessary steps so that those meeting rooms that are provided to all community organisations are not abused. Now, as the Lord Mayor quite clearly stated, there is a policy provided, there are guidelines provided, I'm sorry, to council staff for when they provide these meeting rooms. And the majority of those organisations meet that criteria. But there is, on occasion, such as Extinction Rebellion, a breach of those guidelines. And so the motion today is about making sure that we reiterate the importance of those guidelines and provide the necessary guidance to the council officers when they take these bookings. Now, as we all know, and we often say in this place, our libraries are more than just a place to borrow a book. They are places to meet and for people to gather. And we as councillors support that. But it's importantly also that we don't support the kind of activities that even this state government has said enough is enough. Now, as the Lord Mayor has quite clearly stated in the guidelines around community groups and not-for-profit groups, um, we have seen Extinction Rebellion make bookings in that name. And we have seen them as places of gatherings for the purposes of coordinating their efforts. And the guidelines quite clearly state that meeting rooms are not suitable for activities which advocate or incite illegal activity, such as trespass, vandalism, theft, violence, or hate speech. Now, the actions of Extinction uh, uh, Rebellion are, uh, meet some of these criteria around their illegal activity, such as trespass, such as vandalism. We have seen wide-scale disruption to our city day upon day, week upon week, by these individuals who have lost all sight of what I, they're there for, to talk about sustainability, to talk about climate change, to talk about a bright future, to where their actions now go in all kinds of directions. That is not the place for our community meeting rooms. That is not the place of council officers and is not the place of this council to support those kinds of activities. It's easy for the leader of the opposition and his councillors to grandstand on this issue, to somehow try and support Councillor Shree and whatever arrangement they have. But their own colleagues in George Street are doing what they need to to bring about that change. Their own colleagues in George Street are bringing about the necessary laws to empower the, the Queensland Police Service to take the actions they need so that our city can function. How can we as an organisation be any different? How can we as an organisation simply ignore the guidelines that have been in place since last year? And how can we as an organisation and as councillors not support the council officers in their day-to-day -day activities? And as I said, Mr Chair, there are many, many organisations that meet within our meeting rooms, covering all variety of topics, including the issue of climate change. But this particular one goes outside of that. And so our role here today is to make sure that we provide the necessary guidance to do that. Because ultimately, it's also as a community that we need to do the things we need to, as a council and as a government, to bring some kind of certainty back to people's activities. All of us have stories about the extent of, of damage and inconvenience that 
uh, Extinction Rebellion has provided and has brought upon people throughout our city. People who are just going about their day-to-day -day activities, getting their children to work, getting to work themselves, getting their children to school, going shopping, visiting family, doing their business. Why should those people be impacted by this group of people who are being supported in some form or fashion by the resources of this council? And the answer is they shouldn't. And that is the position of the Lord Mayor. And that is why this is here today. There are many people who have approached the Lord Mayor. You've also seen it uh, on radio and television where people are frustrated at these actions, where the actions of these people are actually impacting on the day to day uh, lives of everyone. So as a council, we say today within this motion that enough is enough, that the, the resources of this council, the rates that people pay to provide those services should not be utilised for activities which are illegal, for activities which cause inconvenience and for activities which obviously are contrary to these guidelines. These guidelines that are common sense, these guidelines that are in the public interest. And that's all we're saying here today, Mr Chair, and it's unfortunate that those officers choose not to support it, or maybe they will, who knows. But ultimately, it is the responsibility of this Lord Mayor, this administration and this council to do the right thing by our community. Point of and order, Mr. Chair. Support. A point of order, uh, Councillor Shree. Sorry, uh, just a clarification. It might be a question of whether Councillor Maddick will take a question, or perhaps it's a question for you to explain and interpret. Does, does the term council facility include parks? Maybe, should, is that something you can rule on, or should I direct uh, that look, as a question um, to. I can't, I, of course, I can't read the minds of the, the authors. Sure. Um, but I. Will Councillor Maddock take a question? Uh, will, Councillor Maddock, would you clarify that matter, please? Um, you, would you take a question? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll take the question. And so in regards to this motion, what we're speaking so, uh, about... Should I ask the question? So, yeah, please, yes, <laughs> yes, Councillor Street, please ask the question. Thanks, through you, Mr Chair, the Councillor Maddock, thank you for engaging in the discussion. Um, the term council facility is obviously quite broad. Does that include public parks? Does that include public squares such as King George Square? Are these facilities, as you understand that term, to include? Councillor Maddock. Um, in, in response to Councillor Shree's question, uh, Mr Chair, the purpose of this motion is specifically in regards to our libraries and meeting rooms. King George Square is a meeting place and a public space. There are guidelines and rules that exist in regards to its use and its bookings. So what we're speaking about here is the utilisation of community uh, facilities such as libraries and community meeting rooms uh, to, in order to be able to not provide those. And including also ward offices, for example, uh, would be included in this as a facility that we are speaking about today. In regards to the other issues uh, of King George Square, for example, there are clear guidelines in respect of what can be accessed through there. In regards to this motion today, uh, Mr Chair, it is important to outline that, um, again, that the state government themselves have taken the necessary steps and this council is doing what is required of itself in response to the public outcry around what uh, Extinction Rebellion is causing to the city. And I would think that the majority of Brisbane residents would think that it was appropriate that we do not provide our facilities for the purposes of, as we said before, illegal activity. Thank you. Further speakers? Councillor Johnston. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Well, this is how it starts. This is how human rights are eroded by ultra-right-wing conservative governments who try and silence dissent, whose try and silence groups who they don't agree with. This is how it has started over the eons in history. Every generation, every century, this is how it has started. And it is extraordinary. In the 12 years I've been here, we've only had one other debate that I felt was massively inappropriate. And there were, the debate itself wasn't, but some of the comments by some councillors in that debate were massively inappropriate. But this just takes the cake. This just takes the cake. Um, the jackboot of Councillor Schrinner is coming down hard and fast on groups in Brisbane who don't uh, agree with what he's saying. Who will be next? Who will be next is the question that I've got, uh, because if, you, if he doesn't like what you're saying, if he believes you're doing something wrong, Lord, you Lord, will fall foul Mayor. of his policy. That is a complete misrepresentation of what I said. 
it's noted and I'll recall you at the end of the presentation. Uh, Councillor Johnston. Well, what's, not, what's to stop them coming in here next week and banning the Country Women's Association because they're unhappy with government policy on water? Or what's to stop them coming in and doing it to another group in this city? Nothing. This is an abuse of power, clear and simple. Clear Point and order, simple. Mr. Chairman. Point of order to you, Councillor Maddox. Councillor Johnston is misleading the chamber. We quite clearly uh, set out within the debate, uh, Mr. Chair, that there are guidelines in regards thank, to our thank facilities you, within the library. I'm going to stop you there. Points of orders aren't to, um, are not, will not be used to uh, rebut people's speech, uh, notes in the middle of their speeches. Uh, Let me be Councillor Johnston. Thank you. Let me be clear. In my view, this motion, moved by Councillor Schrinner and his right-wing Conservative cronies, is an excessive Point of order, Mr. Abuse Chairman. Point of order power. to you, Councillor Owen. It is my understanding that the meeting local law stipulates that councillors are to be referred to appropriately as councillors in this place, not by name calling. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Owen. Now, now um, Councillor Johnston, it wasn't that long yeah. ago in this meeting where okay. you where you took umbrage to, yeah, to certain I'm, I'm titles happy. being uh, used against other yep. councillors. I remind you of the standard you yep. asked other people to yes. uphold. Please use it happy yourself. To re happy to rephrase, Mr Chairman. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to say it again. Um, and this is what we see from uh, this right-wing, uh, ultra-conservative LNP cabal of councillors who are unable to recognise that not everybody in the city of Brisbane has the same opinion. Um, now, do I think that Extinction Rebellion should be blocking our streets, gluing themselves to things, putting booby traps in uh, devices they're locking themselves to on public streets? No, I do not. Do I think that is a matter for the police? Absolutely. And we just spent an hour discussing how we support the police in their activities, and we could have just left it to them. But instead, this, this uh, brand new Lord Mayor, with his training wheels on, brings a motion into this place that wants him to take the training wheel off one foot, teetering around on the other one, and whack his jackboot down on dissent in this city. That is unacceptable. Absolutely unacceptable. Here's some things in not that distant history um, that were completely legal. And under his view of what should and shouldn't be happening in council libraries, people couldn't have met in a publicly funded space to discuss the following issues. Apartheid. Completely illegal. Uh, uh, completely legal, I'm sorry, in South Africa. And the support in this country for people fighting against apartheid would not have been allowed under the reign of Adrian Schrinner, the Lord Mayor of the city of Brisbane. Because uh, if anybody had discussed doing a protest, they couldn't do it in a council-funded library, example one. Example two, segregation in the United States and even here in Australia. Um, it's only a few years ago in both countries um, that Indigenous peoples and black peoples did not have the same rights as those of uh, the white Australians or in uh, the US. Now, if they'd have met in a public library to protest or discuss protesting and fight against segregation or fight, fight for black rights, they would have been breaching council's policy. Would the Lord Mayor have banned that too? Would we have seen the same things that we saw in 1967, where Australians overwhelmingly voted to support recognition of Indigenous peoples in our censor, uh, in our uh, uh, in recognition as an Australian people. No, this Lord Mayor would say not acceptable to have meetings about that because it was illegal before that time. And finally, the Vietnam War. Now, uh, certainly in Australia, there was a huge movement to protest against the Vietnam War, but you couldn't have had a meeting in a council library to meet to discuss a protest um, because protesting would have been illegal. So let me be clear. Um, this is how human rights are eroded. It starts small. It's a creep. It's a, it creeps up on you. That's what this administration has just started doing. And I'm going to leave everybody in here with a question, including for the Lord Mayor in summing up. I haven't heard a single reason here um, or a single bit of evidence to support that there's a problem in our libraries. Not one bit of hard evidence. Here are my questions. How many times have Extinction Rebellion meetings been held in council libraries? That is my question. If we're having a massive problem with the misuse of council libraries 
Presumably, the Lord Mayor can stand up and answer a simple question. How many times have meetings of Ex Extinction Rebellion people been held in a council library? No doubt he's done his homework. He's checked. He's rung around all the libraries and he's asked, have you got a problem with your Extinction Rebellion people there? Are they booking your meeting room? Have they caused any problems in your library? Have they destroyed any public facilities? Are they inciting hate speech? Have you had any problems? Have you had to call the police? How many library bookings have Extinction Rebellion made, Lord Mayor? Um, I'd like to know. Um, I'm aware that they might have used some public parks, and we've got another problem here with this motion um, because it says notes council facilities. Um, so what does that mean? Um, can they, what is the extent of a council facility? And I think that was a valid question by Councillor Shree. If he wants to have a meeting with them in his office, um, what is wrong with that? What is wrong with that? If he incites them or does something wrong and they go out and break the law, that is a matter for the police. Um, but to regulate the behaviour of a group that is engaging in um, protest on an issue that they're not happy about and to say that you can't meet to discuss that, in my view, that is a step too far. That is an erosion of human rights. That is how um, we go down the slippery slope into um, a, 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 terrible, um, a terrible conservative state where dissent is not allowed. So, Lord Mayor, in your summing up, and I hope the journos are listening to me, how many, how many library bookings have Extinction Rebellion made and have there been any problems with those bookings whatsoever? Where is your evidence to justify this motion that is before us? today. That's what I'd like to know. And again, having spent the last hour debating the importance of the police, this is a matter that is best left to them. This is a matter uh, where they can take action. Um, and this is a matter that is properly uh, a matter for the police to ensure that there is no illegal behaviour happening. It is not um, a responsibility of Adrian Schrinner, the newbie councillor and Lord Mayor for the City of Brisbane. Uh, uh, Lord Mayor, uh, you have a misrepresentation. Please limit your remarks to the misrepresentation at hand. Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you. Quite clearly, I in indicated that this is all about groups that incite people to break the law. Not groups that I might disagree with, groups that incite people to break the law. That point was very clear and is simple, and Councillor Johnston was misrepresenting me. Further speakers? Councillor Shree. Thanks, Mr Chair, and I rise to speak against this outrageous attack on freedom of political expression and the um, freedom of public assembly. I'm, having seen this motion, I think the LNP has made a grave strategic error because they've made visible just how authoritarian and intolerant of um, alternative views they really are. The motion is very poorly de defined and poorly drafted, and regardless of what Councillor Schroeder might say, his in intentions are in bringing this motion to the chamber. Um, the practical effect of this motion would be to um, ma make it impossible for any community group that um, is advocating an activity that's currently illegal to meet in any public facility that's controlled by the council. So let's just think about the practical implications of that. A few years ago in this state, abortion was essentially illegal. Now, if a group of, of, of women, if a group of people had met in a council library to say, oh, here, here are some pathways to ab abortion that are available to you, um, in keeping in mind the fact that it's illegal in this state, they would not have been allowed to meet in a council facility. Even now, there's some debate about um, the legalisation of euthanasia and um, assisted dying. Now, it seems to me that if, a, according to the way this motion is worded, if a group of advocates of the right for, to assisted dying were to meet in a, in a public park or a, or a council facility, they too would be, fall in foul of this motion. Um, the, the motion is far broader than the mayor seems to realise or perhaps pretends to realise. Um, and, and I'm particularly concerned that the term council facility could be interpreted down the track as applying to any council park. I think it's important that the Lord Mayor clarifies whether this motion also applies to community facilities that might be owned by council, but leased by other groups. But putting aside the technical debate about the wording of the motion, the broad problem here is that this council is setting itself up as an arbiter yeah. of what people can meet about and what yeah. people can talk about 
and in fact as, a, as an arbiter of what counts as an illegal activity. Because in practice, what this, is going to, what this would mean is that when community groups apply to book a meeting, uh, meet in place, someone from the council is going to say, oh, what are you meeting about? And then make a subjective decision as to whether that group um, is advocating an illegal activity. So we're essentially criminalising or, or cra cracking down, not on illegal activity itself, but on what a council officer might decide could possibly constitute illegal activity. Think about the way the public land and council assets local law is currently worded. Under that local law, there's a wide range of activities that are technically illegal unless you have a, a permit from council. Um, last time I read it, it's been a little while, but the last time I read it, it seemed to make it illegal to hold a large um, public organised sporting activity in a park without a council permit. So if 20 people get together and want to kick a soccer ball around in a park without a permit, they're breaching the public land and council assets local law. So, no, they, so they, I'll take that interjection, Councillor Johnson. So they can't, they can't even meet in a library now to plan their informal soccer game because not only is the informal soccer game illegal due to the um, excessive provisions in the, and overreach in the public land and council assets local law, but now simply meeting to, to contemplate the organising of an informal game of soccer in the, in the park would itself be prohibited in council facilities. And I think what this really makes visible is that this administration pretends to like the idea of freedom of political expression until people start to express ideas that contradict um, the LNP's ability, desire to maintain power and maintain a stranglehold over this city. Um, I would much rather we were spending this time talking about more meaningful and important issues, uh, but in instead we're here fighting a rearguard action against attacks on our basic civil liberties. When I put my hand up to become a councillor, I did not expect or anticipate um, that such sustained and consistent attacks on our basic democratic rights would, would take up so much of my time here as a councillor. But I'm seeing that again and again in this place. Uh, spaces such as King George Square, which may or may not be a council facility, I'm still not quite sure because um, no one's been particularly clear on that point. But spaces like King George Square are increasingly controlled and heavily regulated by council. Um, to limit who can, who can use them. Um, we've, we've heard from a number of groups that have all tried to organise protests in council parks and squares and been told they can't do so unless they have public liability insurance. I'll just say that again. We've had protest groups that have been told they can't hold a public meeting in a council park or square because they don't have public liability insurance. So this isn't just about this one motion. This is about a broader pattern of regulation changes, of policy changes, of local law changes, alongside increasing total, increasingly totalitarian restrictions from the state and federal government that form a network of legal barriers to anyone who seeks to organise and get organised for changes to the current laws or to organise against the totalitarian control of the state. I'm sure there'll be councillors in this place who are rolling their eyes and, and saying, oh, no, no, they're deliberately misinterpreting the, the motion. But when you read the motion, that's, that's actually what it does. And I think it's a very bad look for this administration. I think the people of Brisbane, once they understand how far this administration is going in terms of seeking to exert control over its citizenry, will, will start to wake up and realise just how concerning this is. We, ha we hear continued double speak from this administration. Oh, we support the right to peaceful protest, but we don't support the right to peaceful protest during peak hour, and we don't support the right to peaceful protest if someone's advocating for law reform, and we don't support the right to peaceful protest if we don't agree with what the protesters are saying. That's essentially where we're heading now. And I wish this was hy hyperbole. I wish I was exaggerating, but I don't think I am. I, I, I had a little chuckle when I read the motion because I, I guess I've been in the position of, in the past of advocating activities that might not currently be lawful. So for example, I would have meetings where I think, would, would say, oh, I think it should be, people should be able to um, have, have access to abortion if they wish. Now, I don't know if my office is actually a, a facility, council facility or not, but if, if that is the case, does that mean I can't have a meeting in my own office where I talk about the fact that euthanasia should be legal. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm really concerned by the ramifications of this. Does, does this chamber here count as a council facility? 
And if that's the case, am I not allowed to stand up in this place anymore and say that, oh, maybe people should be able to get support when they, when, when they wish to end their lives because of extreme suffering? There are so many issues where people have a legitimate right and reason to call for changes to the law and to advocate for activity which is currently illegal. And it would be extremely undemocratic to try and prevent that or to limit people's ability to organise in those ways. When you take away the council libraries and the council meeting rooms and the public squares and presumably the public parks, there are very few public spaces left available to community groups who are advocating for social change. And if council proceeds down this road and denies anyone who seeks to advocate for an activity that's not currently lawful, um, it's going to have a very chilling effect on our right to free speech and our democracy more generally. And I think it's a shame that the council is not willing to engage in a more meaningful discussion about how best to balance the rights of different members of our society and instead is taking a one-size-fits-all, broad-brush approach to silence dissent, to crush protest, and to take away our basic civil liberties. Further speakers? There being none, Lord Mayor. Thank you, uh, Mr Chair. It's been fascinating to see the absolute over-the-top response um, from councillors opposite on this issue. Uh, Councillor Cassidy went off half-cocked and um, did his question time performance early. Yes. Um, he had he'd, he'd practised in front of the mirror his first day in school. Uh, fortunately, he entirely botched it. Wrong issue. He's just got one line that he's going to repeat constantly. Uh, we've heard it already. Thanks, Councillor Cassidy. Councillor Johnston, Google Godwin's Law. Um, you might be interested in that one. Uh, because uh, mentioning jackboots is just way over the top. Um, yeah, j just Google it, you'll like it. Um, to make it very clear, what type of facilities are we talking about? Uh, generally speaking, if you can book it, it's a council facility, and we won't be accepting bookings from Extinction Rebellion. It's as simple as that. Now, that doesn't Point include- Point of order, Mr Chair. I want to order to you, Councillor Shree. Will Councillor Shree take a question? Lord Mayor, will you no. take a question? He will not. Lord Mayor, please. If you can book it, it's a council facility. Now, there are some Point of order, Mr. parks Chair. that you can book. Point of order, Councillor Shree. I'm just seeking to clarify, because um, I, I think this is becoming quite a broad motion now. I want, want to understand if your understanding of the term council facility does include pa council parks. I think that, that there's been two lengthy responses to that question provided by uh, uh, administrative speakers today. And I think that if you take a moment to reread the transcript next week, I think it'll be clear where the limitations are. Lord Mayor. I, I'm actually in the process of clarifying right now. There are some sections of parks that you can book. We won't be taking bookings from Extinction Rebellion. Libraries and meeting rooms you can book. Community halls you can book. We won't be taking bookings from Extinction Rebellion. Uh, it's pretty clear. Like, it's pretty straightforward. Having said that, uh, there's nothing to stop people meeting in other sections of a park that can't be booked. There's nothing to stop people meeting in their own homes and in other public places. Uh, so this absolutely ludicrous idea that we're stopping people meeting and talking about something. I'll tell you what we're doing. We're doing what Councillor Cassidy claims he's interested in which is the use of ratepayer funds and facilities. Right. We're actually making sure that ratepayer funds and facilities aren't used to disrupt the lives of Brisbane residents. That's what we're doing. And if Councillor Cassidy actually had any genuine concern about this, he'd be backing this motion, because he's quite happy. It's interesting, it's his first test of leadership today. Two fails in a row. He backed Councillor Shree's outrageous comments about the Queensland police force being violent and racist, and now he's backing Extinction Rebellion's misuse of ratepayer funds and facilities to disrupt the community. Two strikes, a third, and you're out, Councillor Cassidy. And given, and given Labor's record on rolling leaders, he doesn't have much time left, I would predict. Councillor Johnston, please. It's killing season for the Labor stop Party. Interjecting the same way over and over. Lord Mayor. So let's not hear any of these 
hyperbolic arguments about uh, shutting down debate. What is very clear here, and it is very, very clear, is that organisations, and we've specifically named one, and one only, organisations that incite people and train people to break the law won't, won't have the privilege of using council-funded facilities Point of order, or ratepayer-funded facilities. Point of order, Point of order uh, Councillor Shree. Just wondering if the, the Mayor would take a question about whether this would also apply to lock the gate, the organisation lock the uh, gate. Um, well, it's the same process as normal. Lord Mayor, will you take a question? Uh, no. No, he will not. So, um, Lord Mayor, Councillor Shree made a, um, a, an interesting claim that he said that if you're advocating for law reform, you'll somehow fall, fall foul of this rule. No, no. Advocating for law reform is completely lawful. That's right. Encouraging people to break the law is an entirely different thing. Right. They are two different things. And if you can't understand that simple difference, then uh, back to school, Councillor Shree. Councillor Johnston, you've interjected the, for the majority of this speech. I direct you to cease interjecting. Now, let me mayor. make it very clear. As far as I'm aware, the Greens' political party can use council facilities, they can book. The Labor Party can use council facilities, they can book. There's no rules preventing that from happening. The union movement can use council facilities, and in fact they regularly yeah, do. They do. That's right. We're not saying that none of that can happen. So this argument that somehow someone we disagree with is not allowed to use council facilities, absolute fallacy, absolute rubbish. This is about people actively encouraging and training people to break the law and disrupt Brisbane residents. Now, if there's any doubt that Extinction Rebellion is doing that, let, let me read from their own publication here. Who are we and why we rebel? This is uh, Extinction Rebellion, South East Queensland. So this is the, one, the local the one we're talking about. Exist. Yeah, the, the organisation that apparently doesn't exist. Um, we are a complex web of small autonomous groups across the world who are evolving and growing together. We promote, train and participate in peaceful direct action. We transform our despair tactics into tactics of rebellion. The third world war, that of profit versus life, is well underway. We break the rules to convey to those who profit from the destruction of our future that we are serious and unafraid. According to their own material, uh, they break the rules. Now, civil disobedience, by its nature, is breaking the rules. And when you have hundreds of people being a arrested by the police, it's not because the police don't happen to like them, it's because they're breaking the law. Point of order, Mr Chair. Point of order to you, Councillor Shree. Can I ask that the Lord Mayor table that document? Lord Mayor, would you consider tabling that document? Uh, once I get a copy of this is the only copy I have, but once I get a copy of it, I'm happy to table it. Yeah. Thank you. This um, it's interesting reading, Councillor Shree. <laughs> um, the uh, the reality is civil civil disobedience is about breaking the law, and um, so we're not saying that you can't advocate for law change. By all means, you can. We're not saying that if a group disagrees with us, you can't meet in a council facility. No, because the Labor Party can, the Greens can. The unions can, uh, all, types, all types of organisations can, but they're not advocating and training people to break the law. And they're not, and, and, and this is very detailed, it's not just a general thing, they're actually explaining how you use locking devices, how you glue yourself to things, how you can maximise the disruption to the community, but also how you can resist arrest when the police come uh, to make sure that the law is enforced. So this is what is happening, and council libraries are being used for these purposes. I don't think that's appropriate. This is not about uh, debate here. This is about encouraging and inciting people and training people to break the law. Right. And if Councillor Cassidy and his Labor colleagues do genuinely care about ratepayer funds and the use of ratepayer money, they will back this motion. Uh, councillors, um, to the 
urgency resolution in front of us to the resolution in front of us. All those in favour say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. no. The ayes have it. Division. Division. Division called by the Lord Mayor and Councillor Owen. Eyes to my right, nose to my left. Please ring the bells. Councillor Shree, Councillor Shree, could you arrange to have a discussion with the media outside, but not at a, not at a division, please. Uh, attendants, please close the bars. Clerks, please read the result. Mr Chair, the ayes have it, the voting being 17 in favour and six against. The ayes have it. Please return to your seats. Point of order. Where do I go? Oh, Steve, uh, <laughs> Councillor Grivers. <laughs> I want to order to you, uh, Councillor Grewitz. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr Chairman. I, I was also waiting to move an urgency motion as well. So um, I move suspension of standing orders to enable me to move the following urgency motion, very topical, that this council reaffirms its commitment to allow every councillor to have their right to speak in council meetings. Seconded. Right, there's an urgency resolution uh, presented by Councillor Griffiths, seconded by Councillor Cassidy. Councillor, Gri Councillor Griffiths, you have three minutes to establish, thank you, uh, yep. establish urgency as to why this matter must be dealt with today. And thank you, uh, Mr Chair. I will. Mr Chair, um, we all know and we've heard today, we've heard some, some fine speeches in the last hour. I think uh, the one that I liked was that this chamber is a reflection of the importance of democracy, and that was Councillor Maddock. Um, and they were fine words and well rehearsed. And what we think is that this chamber should be a place of robust debate, an exchange of ideas, whether we like them or not, and the opportunity to challenge those ideas. But what we saw at the last council meeting, the last time we met in this place, was exactly the opposite. And that's why I'm raising this as a point of urgency today. Because what we saw at that last meeting on Tuesday the 10th of September this year was that the LNP used its massive majority to guillotine or close the meeting. And this was despite the fact, despite the fact that at least three councillors in this place had said they wanted to speak in general business. So despite the fact, I believe, that Councillor Shri, Councillor Johnson and myself had all indicated that we wanted to speak in general business, this Lord Mayor and his LMP team shut down the meeting. And the reason they shut down the meeting, as far as I can tell, was that they didn't want the issue of bushland acquisition to be discussed any further. Because they didn't like what you had to say. 
They didn't want to hear what we had to say. They didn't like what we had to say. In fact, the very debate we were having, the very debate we were having about bushland acquisition. Point of order, Point of order Mr. To Chair. You, uh, um, Deputy Mayor. Just asking what the urgency for yeah, this motion is, please. I appreciate that. Uh, Councillor Griffiths, um, I appreciate you making the point material to the resolution, but can I ask you to, make, to, to draw your comments back to why it is urgent, why it must be dealt with immediately? The, ur <laughs> the urgency is what we've just spent the last hour talking about. The urgency is in relation to the fact that all councils in this chamber should actually be able to have a say and should be able to be listened and not be guillotined, not be shut off. That's the urgency. And this is the opportunity for the LNP to vote for this urgency motion, which says that it reaffirms the commitment of every councillor to have their right to speak in council meetings. So that's the opportunity here. The LNP have the opportunity now of voting for this motion. It's not controversial. It's actually saying that we believe in robust debate, that we believe that people have a right to speak and that we shouldn't be cutting debates off. People of Brisbane expect us and want us to do better, and they expect that by us participating in robust uh, debates. Griffiths, your, your time has expired. Thank you. I encourage um, all councillors to vote for this motion. Uh, all those in favour of the, that this matter is urgent, say aye. Aye. And to the contrary, no. No. Uh, I believe. Could I uh, could I ask for that vote again, please? Because now, now, hang on, hang on, Councillor Johnston. For urgency, there has to be two thirds. Okay. Well, point of order. Point of order, Councillor Johnston. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Um, if there has been, if you've called the vote and the vote is clearly won by one side, um, you cannot recall the vote because you do not like the outcome. Um, so, in my well, view, Councillor Mr. Chairman, Johnston, yeah, Councillor that, Johnston, that, that's pretty much against the standing rules, and I'd certainly ask that you allow Councillor uh, Griffith to move his uh, motion now. Well, Councillor Johnston, the thing about it is, is that it's not a simple majority, but rather a two-thirds majority that is required for urgency. There was also a lack of clarity in this, and if um, you wanted to lean into the democracy argument, then everyone should have their say, right? Do you, do you understand? All right, all right. On the matter of urgency, all those who believe this is urgent, say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Further speakers, uh, uh, Councillor Griffiths, to the material matter in the resolution, please. Oh, well, I congratulate the chamber on supporting this motion. Uh, <laughs> it was rather surprising. Look, I will go back to my point. I will go back to my point that the reason we have done this today is because we were disgusted by the way the meeting was shut down last time. It was wrong that the meeting was shut down because the LNP didn't like what was being discussed. What was being discussed was about the way the bushland funding is being used. What was being discussed is the way and the misappropriation, many of us believe— Point of order. Order, Mr. Uh, Sorry, Councillor Griffiths, can we have a copy of the motion? We haven't heard it in full. We got a motion uh, urgency, um, but no motion Councilor before Griffiths, us. I have a copy of the resolution. Do you have enough copies for everybody? Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't. All right. Okay. Excuse sorry. me, everybody. I'm just going to. The resolution is that this council reaffirms its commitment to allow every councillor to have the right to speak in council meetings. Would anyone like me to say that again? <laughs> that this council reaffirms its commitment to allow every councillor to have the right to speak in council meetings. I trust everybody uh, it's, it's, understands that. Uh, Councillor Griffiths, apologies for that. Please continue. Yes, it's, it's a pretty simple motion. It's a pretty hard one to argue against, uh, Mr Chair. And the reason, as I said, we did it was because the meeting was shut down. It was guillotined by this LNP administration using its massive majority. It wasn't done actually in the best and most, uh, most technically proficient way either, uh, which was the result of confusion as well. 
But what we are clearly saying on this side of the chamber is just because the LNP don't like what is being discussed, they don't like the points that are being made, they don't enjoy the effectiveness of the debate, it's not a reason to shut the meeting down. The whole idea of this chamber is to be able to present many ideas, present different ideas, even though the majority mightn't like hearing those ideas. So, Mr Chairman, this is very important that we have a commitment from the, from the LNP in particular that they will not cut, down, cut general business in the future with councillors being, without councillors being given the opportunity to have their say. That is all we're asking for. Thank you, Mr Chair. Further speakers, Councillor uh, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr Chair. And I rise to support this motion. But, um, the mock outrage from Councillor Griffiths and the rewriting of history is absolutely amazing. We did not shut down debate on that night. As <laughs> Councillor Cumming, I would keep your head down. There's a reason you're third seat along now. We had a very clear discussion between our whip and our leader point of, of the opposition. A point of order, Councillor Johnston. Yeah, look, honestly, is that appropriate? It just seems that that kind of level of personal attack, which Councillor Adams doesn't like, oh, no, she mate. doesn't like it and raises it, is that um, really appropriate? I'm not sure. I mean, Councillor, Councillor, you're not shy when it comes to personal attacks. Um, uh, Pot kettle Deputy black, Mayor, thank you, Mr continue. Chair. Um, we had several discussions between our whip and the leader of the opposition, three confirmations with the Leader of the Opposition that they had no general business speakers. Wrong. Three. No, not wrong, wrong, Councillor Griffiths. It should have been had with the whip, but the whip at the time does not discuss with our whip. That's how the floor of chambers work across the nation. We also talked with the Councillor for the Wool and Gabba Ward, who made it clear he had an appointment he was leaving at 7 o'clock. He made that very clear, which is why when the meeting was closed, he saw a great opportunity for mock outrage and came screaming back in because he'd already left. We were told the debate for the evening was finished. We closed the meeting, as per usual, at 7 o'clock, but we are happy to support this motion. I just hope that when we go to dinner, they bother to come back. Further speakers? Uh, Councillor Shree. Thanks, Mr Chair. I rise to speak on the motion. <clears throat> I take issue with some of what the previous speaker said, but in the interest of um, healing and constructively moving forward together, um, I thought I'd just clarify what I think went wrong at the end of that last meeting, because it, it, it is indeed the case that I, I initially told Count, Councillor Richards that I didn't have anything to say in general business. But what then happened was that the LNP tabled a motion that had been brought by another council in this chamber and prevented discussion on that motion. Yes. Now that wasn't part of any discussion about um, when the meeting would end. I simply said, yeah, I've got nothing to say in general business, and then suddenly this administration guillotine debate yes. on a notified motion. Point of order. Point of order. That is total misrepresentation. We lay the motion on the table. Guillotine debate. Um, no, no. Now, hang on. The, the resolution wasn't about the, um, the um, procedural matter of that motion. It was about it, it occurred in general business. Um, so. The, the, the moment you're talking about, it, the period for notified motions had passed in this meeting. It was in general business. Please continue, Councillor Shree. <laughs> Thanks, Mr Chair. I'm not sure if I'm debating you or, or whether you're impartially facilitating the meeting, but I'll, um, I'll, I'll take what you're saying because I think this is important to understand, and particularly for Councillor Richards and anyone else who takes on that role of whip in the future, which is that we had a notified motion that was on the agenda for debate. And this administration, without consulting me, I'm, I presume without consulting um, Councillor Johnston, who'd moved the motion, decided to move to lay that motion on the table. Now, I, I wasn't told that that was going to happen, and I certainly wouldn't have agreed to that, because I think if a notified motion is brought onto the agenda, then it should be debated. That's right. um, so the moment that the, that the LNP decided that that notified motion would not be open to debate and moved to put, move that on the to leave that to lie on the table. Um, I had a lot to say in general business after that. I had plenty to say because I thought it was outrageous that a motion, a notified motion could be left to lie on the table like that without proper discussion. Um, now, I'm not, I'm, I, I might disagree with some of the other 
councillors in this place because I don't personally think that that was done by Councillor Richards out of malice. I think it was just a communication breakdown. Um, but I, I think that there was a communication breakdown and the correct way to resolve that would have been for um, myself, Councillor Johnston and the major party whips to meet out, out in the antechamber and have a quick conversation before a decision was made to cut short um, debate. I was further incensed by the fact that while I'd been given the impression that the LNP did not wish to speak during general business, my recollection is that the deputy mayor did indeed speak during general business. So after persuading us that it was important that we finish by 7 p.m. and that we shouldn't raise any matters during general business, I would sit in here still at five past seven listening to um, the deputy mayor speak during general business. Um, and that too felt very one-sided and unfair because I'd agreed that I wouldn't raise anything in general business in order that we might finish by 7 p.m. only to find that the LNP deputy mayor was speaking during general business. And that too felt like a betrayal of trust and a breakdown of the agreement that we'd, we'd reached previously. So I'm, I'm sure others will watch the video back and, and draw their own conclusions. But what's very clear to me is that there was a clear communication breakdown and rather than seeking to rectify and mediate that breakdown and, and make amends, the administration dug its heels in, silenced debate and cut short the meeting when councillors from the opposition still had things to say. That's entirely inappropriate. Um, it's very rare for me to shout and interject in this chamber. I pride myself on the fact that I don't ordinarily interrupt other councillors. Um, but I was very angry at the end of that last meeting because I felt I'd been betrayed by Councillor Richards and I'd been be betrayed by the administration that I'd tried to negotiate with in good faith. Now, as I said, I'm willing to accept that that was an honest mistake, that it wasn't deliberate malice. Um, but I think for this administration to try and blame the opposition councillors for grandstanding when actually you guys made a significant error and then failed to rectify it is very poor form. So I hope in future there will be clearer communication between the party whips. It would be nice, for example, to have phone numbers so that we could coordinate this stuff um, even when someone steps out of the room. But more importantly, it would be nice to, be, um, to, see, to feel that there's a genuine commitment to free and respectful debate in this place. And unfortunately, I don't feel that at the moment. I feel that this administration uses every opportunity to silence dissent, to cut short debate, and to avoid scrutiny over important issues. Further speakers, Councillor Richards. Uh, Mr Chair, as it is now 4.06 p.m., I move that council now adjourn for afternoon tea for 15 minutes, which commences only when all councillors have vacated the chamber and the doors have been locked. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Richard, seconded by Councillor Owen to this uh, council now adjourn for the purpose of afternoon tea for a period of 15 minutes, commencing when all councillors have vacated the chamber and the doors have been locked. All those in favour say aye. aye. The contrary, no. no. The ayes have it.
Uh, welcome back, councillors. Uh, are there further speakers on to the resolution? Councillor Johnston. Yes, um, there are, Mr. Chairman, and I thank Councillor Griffith uh, for uh, and the Labor Party for moving this motion. One would have thought that it may be redundant in a democratic place that all elected representatives in a, in a uh, representative democracy would get the chance to speak. Um, but that is not how this council has functioned uh, for many years. And one of the most egregious examples of that was at the last council meeting in September. Now, the deputy mayor stood up and said, um, oh, the whip had consulted with the leader of the opposition and consulted with councillor Shree. What she had to withdraw in the media statements uh, at the time that happened about this um, were that uh, I was not consulted um, as the councillor for Tennyson. So let me be clear, the LNP could not be bothered to speak to me. Two things happened on that night um, that stifled democratic debate and the rights of councillors to speak. That was firstly, I moved a motion seconded by Councillor Griffith calling for the buyback of important bushland at 67 Chapman Place, Oxley. That motion was shut down without discussion with me, without reason, um, without any debate. It was shut down by the LNP um, to stop debate. That is what happened. They stopped debate on an important issue of concern to Councillor Griffith's area and soon to be uh, my area in Tennyson Ward. That was wrong. If there was some reason, did they discuss it with me? No. Um, did they talk to me? No. They used their massive majority to shut down debate. The Lord Mayor has been overwhelmed, I know, with emails and letters from residents of Oxley who are concerned about this matter. And you know what he's done? He's written back to them saying, we're only interested in this land if we can get it for free. Meanwhile, this administration will, will not allow a debate to occur. Now, that's the first thing that happened. The LNP shut down debate on a properly notified motion Point without of order, Mr. Chair. reason or discussion. Order to you, the history Mayor. lesson is not relevant to whether we support debate in the chambers. Um, thank you. Um, thanks, Deputy Mayor. Um, look, I'll, I'll, I think it's, it's fair for Councillor Johnson to make comments regarding what motivated this. Um, so, Councillor Johnson, please continue. Of course it is. We're having a debate about the right to have a debate. And yet again, the deputy mayor is on her feet trying to stop it. Point of she order. Goes. Deputy mayor. Claim to be misrepresented. Noted. She's trying to say that what I'm saying is not relevant and I shouldn't be allowed to say it. She's trying to stop <laughs> debate. Now, let's be clear. Everything I've said tonight is factually true. I moved a motion. Uh, I was the only speaker to that motion. Without warning, discussion or reason, the LNP uh, whip stood up and shut down debate. Councillor Griffith, who wanted to debate the motion, was not allowed to. Um, that is wrong. There was no reason, no discussion, no warning, no consultation, but that's how this administration rolls. They want to shut down debate so that councillors do not have the chance to have a discussion. That was the first time. The second time it happened was minutes later when, uh, in general business, um, they decided to shut the meeting down. Now, I, no one had spoken to me on the LNP side, and isn't it fascinating? Apparently, they're having discussions with the ALP, they're having discussions with the Greens. They're not even bothering to speak to me. So I had no idea the LNP was going to shut down debate. Um, I certainly wanted to speak in general business about the disgusting way in which they stifled debate on 67, Oxley, uh, on, uh, 67 Chapman Place, Oxley, and I wasn't able to because this administration shut down debate. They did so without consultation with me, without discussion and without explanation. That is appalling, but they have form when it comes to this type of behaviour. Um, let me be clear, the former chairman of this council used to shout at councillors to sit down if you were saying something she didn't like. She would shout at you repeatedly to resume your seat if you were saying, she, uh, saying something she didn't like. She would, uh, she would stop you from speaking about a matter um, that was under discussion in the uh, debate before us if she didn't like what you were talking about. Let me give you an example. 
Uh, in the budget debate two years ago, I was discussing uh, the Fairfield Neighbourhood Plan uh, and the Sherwood Neighbourhood Plan, both of which were funded for different reasons in the budget of that year. Um, the chairman of council said I could not speak about them. She uh, then illegally ejected me from Brisbane City Council to stop me speaking at all. Two years later, here's a court case with some really interesting comments from the judge along the lines of, it's very hard to find a reason of why this happened at all. Now, that is how this council has rolled for the best part of 10 years. The worst part of it is the LNP administration have done a disservice to the residents of Oxley by saying that the important issue of concern to them is not worthy of debate in this place without consultation, without discussion and without reason. You can be clear they all know how this LNP administration rolls. I've, taken, uh, I've let them know. I've put it on Facebook. I've emailed them. Um, it is appalling the way the LNP treat non-LNP ward councillors, and it is appalling the way the LNP treat non-LNP wards. They are denied the right to debate in this place. They are denied the right to vote in this place. They are denied the right to even have motions considered in a timely way. That is how this LNP administration rolls, and it is wrong. So again, I thank Councillor Griffith for putting the motion on the table, and you can be sure every time they try and stifle debate, and they're going to get an opportunity in just a little bit, um, we can see how they go. Further speakers? Councillor Cassidy. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just rise to speak in support of um, Councillor Griffith's uh, motion here, which I think is very topical, uh, in, uh, particularly today, where uh, we have heard, um, it seems like from, from the administration, both sides of the argument around freedom of speech and, and the ability in a democratic place to, um, to, to air, air one's views. Uh, and this has come about because uh, I think it is important and it is timely for us to reinforce uh, our, our democratic right uh, to contribute to debate in this place, whether that's on a particular item uh, like this, uh, on a motion, on, a, on an ENC item, a committee report or in general business. And um, I do note that Council Griffiths, um, as the whip, um, as the Labor Party whip, wasn't consulted yes. about who would be speaking on what in general business. I was part of the conversation that Councillor Richards had with Councillor Cumming at the time, uh, and we told Councillor Richards that we believe the meeting would be going beyond 7 p.m. That's what we said at the time. Now, Councillor Adams has gone out there in the media and, and, and told anyone, all and sundry, uh, that uh, we were consulted and we said we didn't have general business. Now, this is all, this is all ancient history now, but it is, important, it is important to put on the record uh, the correct sequence of events and actually what happened. Uh, and the arguments that the, the administration made uh, last time we were in this place and, and to the media uh, was that oh, the meeting had gone past seven, uh, therefore the staff uh, had to go home we couldn't proceed beyond then. Um, however, except for the fact that um, the meeting had already gone past seven, we should have adjourned for dinner. Uh, and that is, that is the rule in this place, and that's what we all accept as councillors here. It happens quite frequently. We have that hour break, we come back and contribute uh, to the debate uh, in general business. So I think it is really important, and I'm glad that uh, Councillor Adams has said that uh, even though uh, she was part of guillotining the, the debate, uh, in a guillotine debate on the uh, motion about bushland, uh, gagging debate in this place by closing down the meeting even though councillors were on their feet saying they wanted to continue to contribute uh, to uh, general business in this place, even though the Councillor Adams was uh, part of, of that uh, disgraceful act in this place in silencing debate uh, and seeing the further erosion of democracy in a Brisbane City Council. I'm glad to see today that the uh, LMP in this place <coughs> pardon me, uh, will be supporting Councillor Griffith's motion today. Further speakers? There being none, Councillor Griffiths. Thank you, Mr Chair. And I, look, I welcome the debate. It's been interesting to hear the various sides. It's glad, I'm glad that there's so much agreement uh, with, uh, with this very simple motion. Um, I suppose what I am seeking and what we are seeking as opposition councillors is the fact that um, debate is allowed to happen. And um, for that to be allowed to happen, it needs to depend on the majority to keep, um, keep the chamber functioning. So what we are clearly saying here is that um, you're going to get the debate. It's going to happen. There's going to be things said that you don't like. 
um, but that's how it works. And it's really up to the LNP majority and the mayor to ensure that that happens. Um, because anything less than that happening is not good for us, but it's also not good for the residents of Brisbane, and I believe it delivers bad outcomes for our city. Um, so I'd encourage everyone to uh, support this motion uh, when we do the call of voices. Thank you. All right. All those, <coughs> excuse me, all those who support the resolution say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Division. Division. Division called by Councillor Johnston and Councillor Griffiths. Eyes to my right, nose to my left. Please ring the bells. Attendants, please close the bars. Clerks, please read the result. Mr Chair, the ayes have it, the voting being 24 in favour. The ayes have it, please return to your chairs. Point of order. All right, another point of order. A point of order, Councillor Johnston. It's just a procedural motion. Oh, uh, right. oh, another motion. All right. Okay. But it, it may lead to motion debate in the spirit of the fact that all councillors should be heard and be able to discuss issues of importance. I move that the uh, motion relating to 67 Chapman Place be taken off the table. Seconded. All right. I have a procedural motion that the um, item. Um, that has been put on the table comes off the table. Excuse me, this, there was a note for me. All right, thank you. All right. All right, so it's a simple uh, procedural motion that the motion be taken off the table. That's been moved by Councillor Johnston, Councillor Griffiths, yes? Um, all right, now, as because it's a procedural motion, Point of order, Mr Chair. Point of order. Can I just ask a clarification question? Yes. If it comes off the table, when is it debated? I would expect immediately. As in, if it was, uh, well, I, the way I interpret this is that if it comes off the table now, we will debate it now. That's, that's, my, that's how I would understand it. Um, yeah, so, um, so I will. I have a, a procedural motion. I will now put that resolution. All those in favour in taking the motion regarding um, the Oxley land off the table say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. No. Uh, the noes have it. Uh, division. Division. Called by Councillor Johnston and Councillor Second. Uh, eyes to my right, nose to my left. Please ring the bells. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. Okay, I'll just tidy this up. If you'd like it to come off the table, you stand on my right, and if you don't, you stand on my left, all right? Please close the bars. Clerks, please read the result. 
Mr Chair, the noes have it, the voting being 7 in favour and 17 against. The noes have it. Please return to your seats. All right, councillors, are there? Um, all right, I will now uh, draw the council's attention to item four, question time. Are there any questions of the Lord Mayor or a chair of any standing committee? Councillor Toomey. Thank you, uh, Chair. I thought we'd never get here. Uh, my question is to the Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, this administration recently announced that we are fast tracking investment in parks and green space through our Green Future Fund. With the first purchase from the fund coming through Council today, can you outline how the Schrinner administration is keeping Brisbane clean and green and increasing our green space for future generations? Lord Mayor. <clears throat> Thank you, Councillor Toomey, for the question. And uh, you rightly point out that uh, the very first acquisition from the Green Future Fund uh, this year, a $20 million fund uh, to create new parkland opportunities uh, around Brisbane. Uh, we are bringing through for approval today uh, the first purchase. Uh, and that purchase is uh, just one of many purchases that will occur um, over the coming months. Uh, this particular one is at 97 Chilton Street, Sunnybank Hills. It is a property that uh, has been put on the market and uh, it is uh, consisting of uh, quite a significant amount of bushland, but also an area that would be suitable for community use and community space. And so we're moving uh, to purchase the land. We're uh, using $2 million from the Green Future Fund towards the acquisition of part of the land, in particular the part that is suitable for uh, parkland purposes, uh, and then uh, $1 million from the Bushland Acquisition Fund for the acquisition of the bushland on the site. Uh, so this is something that I, I must say has been championed by Councillor Kim Marks. Uh, it is something that she, as a local councillor, brought to our attention. Uh, she fought for and she has been successful in identifying what is a good opportunity for her local residents and her local community. And interestingly, I wanted to point out that it is very different from a case where, for example, the state government wants to flog off land and then the Labor Party says, oh, we should spend ratepayers' money to buy land that is already owned by ratepayers. Uh, this is privately owned land that we are acquiring, taking the opportunity while it's on the market to create new parkland and new bushland reserve that will come into public ownership uh, and be an asset to, to the community for the long term. And uh, this is an initiative that I am particularly excited about because, like I said, this is the first acquisition, but the first of many acquisitions. Uh, we have $20 million to invest uh, in the current budget. There'll be more funding becoming available as the dividends from CBIC roll in. And I can't think of a better way to invest in the city's future uh, than uh, creating new parks and also preserving our green space in this way. So it's a great example of two absolutely critical council programs, uh, the Bushland Acquisition Program and also now the Green Future Fund coming together to create a good outcome uh, for the people of Brisbane. And uh, we will continue to do that. Now, in relation to uh, some discussion we just had in the chamber about a particular site at Chapman Street uh, that Councillor uh, Nicole Johnson, Chapman Place, uh, mentioned. I want to be very clear, we have not ruled out purchasing that right. land. We have not ruled that out, and I made it very clear in my letter to residents. But we wanted to see what the outcome of the DA is, which is currently under assessment, before we make that decision. Uh, so, and that is a perfectly reasonable approach to take, because we know, we know that in, ca in the case of, we know that uh, Labor councillors would prefer to see that money going to the Labor state government to fill their budget black hole. But you know what? We want it to go uh, to protecting bushland that is not already owned by ratepayers. 
And so as part of the, uh, the DA assessment process, we will, as we uh, regularly do, uh, seek to obtain uh, the, the bushland component of that uh, particular block at low or minimal cost to ratepayers, which is the best use of ratepayer funds. And so while we certainly haven't ruled out purchasing the site, we want the DA to take its course before we make a final decision. And so Councillor Johnston can try and spin this any way she likes. This is not about stifling debate. This is about making sure that when we debate, it is an informed debate, knowing all the facts at hand and knowing the outcome of the DA, which is under assessment right now, and knowing also that council is working very hard behind the scenes to obtain that bushland, but to obtain it at the lowest possible cost to ratepayers uh, so that we can get a great outcome. Because every dollar saved uh, when it comes to land like this is a dollar that's available for protecting at-risk bushland across the city. And it's certainly not a dollar that's available for buying state government-owned bushland, which is already owned by the ratepayers and taxpayers of Brisbane. And this demonstrates, this issue demonstrates very clearly the big difference between Labor and between the administration here with Team Schrinner. We are focused on protecting land, focused on buying land. The Labor Party is quite happy to see their state colleagues up in George Street selling off publicly owned uh, land. Lord Mayor, your uh, time we won't expired. tolerate it. We Lord won't Mayor, stand your, your for time it. Expired. Uh, further questions? Councillor Cassidy. Uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, my question is to the Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, when asked by the media how much your cash payment expense of office was costing ratepayers each year, you couldn't or wouldn't answer. Can you tell us exactly how much this perk is costing ratepayers on record? Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you for the question, uh, Councillor Cassidy. Uh, but uh, look, I would simply say, don't you believe what you read in the Courier Mail? Uh, and don't you believe what your Lord Mayoral candidate says? Because there's two sources of information there. Uh, ultimately, though, what I can say is this. In all of the time that I have been in this chamber, and all the time I am aware of in Brisbane City Council, dating back to the very first Lord Mayor of Brisbane, this allowance has existed. Councillors, councillors, Lord Mayor. Councillors, please allow the Lord Mayor's answer to be heard in silence. Lord Mayor. Uh, so if you've got a gripe with someone, uh, William Jolly would be the place to start as the first Lord Mayor of Brisbane. Uh, but ultimately, I would suggest you have a read in the Courier Mail. Further questions? Councillor Davis. Uh, thank you, Chair. My question is to the Chair of the Public and Active Transport, Economic and Tourism Development Committee, Councillor Adams. Deputy Mayor, I refer to the full standing load data that is being published by this council every month, the data that details every bus service that is unable to stop and pick up passengers because there is overcrowding. I understand TransLink has now issued council with a breach notice for releasing this data. Whoa. Why is the state government so afraid of these figures being made public, and how beneficial is the Metro project to decreasing these numbers? Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr Chairman, and thank you, Councillor Davis, for the question, because not only is it a pertinent question, but it's one that drives right to the heart of the lack of integrity that we see by the Palaszczuk government. Another month has passed, and hundreds of Brisbane buses have skipped their stops. Hundreds of would-be passengers left behind because the state is spending $5.4 billion on Chris River, Cross River Rail and not one new bus service, when 67 per cent of Brisbane residents actually travel by bus. In the past seven years, an extra 300,000 people have moved to Brisbane, yet there hasn't been any new investment into the bus network to match this growth. As a part of our administration's commitment to openness and transparency, we don't want there to be any secrets. That's why Lord Mayor Adrian Schrinner has committed to releasing the full standing load data each and every month. These figures detail every bus service that is unable to pick up passengers because it's too full. But where is this happening? Why is it happening? And what can we do about it? Before I get to this, I want to report on being silenced again by the Transport Minister. We didn't even get to our third release of this information before Minister Bailey intervened and tried to gag us. He ordered his officers to slam council with a contract breach. That's what you get for being upfront with your residents—a breach notice. 
Will he cancel Brisbane's bus services because we're releasing this data? Only time will tell. He knows the figures are really bad. That's why he wants us not to tell anyone about it. So, with the greatest of integrity, he doesn't want them shared because, of course, it reflects on his poor performance. Most of all, most of all, he knows that Metro is going to fix the problem. But he continues to play party political games with no consideration for commuters that are sitting in gridlock day in, day out on full buses. We think res residents should be kept in the loop on why their buses aren't picking them up, and they should know what we are doing about it. But Minister Bailey has a different idea. He wants them left in the dark, left on the platform, with no reasons why. The breach notice does show us one thing. He is actually capable of making a decision. That's a nice start. But it is more about keeping residents in the dark from this do-nothing Palaszczuk government. Minister Bailey has had nearly a year to approve Council's metro station, over 300 meetings, and it's still on the to-do list. His in-principle support is no longer sufficient. He needs to make a decision. Metro is the game changer for Brisbane. It will slash travel times. It will ease congestion and get residents home quicker and safer. It's all about making sure the Brisbane of tomorrow is better than the Brisbane of today. And it is hardly surprising, because this is exactly why we plan the Metro, that the Metro will cover the city's worst bus routes. The ones the Metro will take over are our full standing load bus stops. It will free up the existing buses and will get them servicing the suburbs more often. The Metro is a plan to fix the bus network. But the transport minister simply refuses to lend a hand. We're not asking for a cent. We're just asking for a signature. He's literally doing the opposite of what his job asks. The Metro would triple the number of services on Route 66, the same rich route which has over 3,000 missed stop services this year. Yeah. It is a plan to get residents home quicker and safer. It will ease that congestion, will get Brisbane moving. Currently, those on the 66 don't have a turn up and go service, but the high capacity and high frequency metro will make sure they do. Building Brisbane Metro is part of Team Schooner's plan to make sure that people get home quicker and safer and the Brisbane of tomorrow is even better than the Brisbane of today. We will continue to make sure the residents of Brisbane know what the bus services are delivering and, in this case, not delivering, and call on Minister Bailey to step up. Get out of the way and let us start building Metro. Further questions? Councillor Cassidy. Uh, thank you, Chair. My question is to the Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, uh, when pressed on what you are spending your ratepayer-funded cash payments on as Lord Mayor, you wouldn't answer. In the interest of accountability, will you tell rate the ratepayers of Brisbane what you have been spending these cash payments on? Lord Mayor. I did answer the question at the time. Uh, yeah, just because you don't like the answer doesn't mean I didn't answer the question. And in fact, I answered it about three or four times. Uh, and the answer is this, exactly the same thing every Lord Mayor in city's history has spent it on. Exactly the same thing. Further, uh, further questions? Councillor Cunningham. Point of order, Mr Chair. Point of order to you, Councillor Shree. Sorry to interrupt. I just want to note and draw to your attention. You've previously confirmed that opposition, opposition councillors will get one in every seven questions. Um, there have oh, now been look, seven Councilor opposition Shree, councillors. I, I tend not to. I, um, I was intending to give you the next question. Sure. So uh, that would I'd be like one. Be one that would be one in eight rather than one in seven. So I just yes, want you I to recognise that uh, your the, method's the, not. The argument's been made to me a yeah. few times, and I appreciate um, that the previous the, the substance of it, and I. Um, Sure. I hope that by the end of the session, the ratio is satisfactory to you. Okay. Um, but also, at the same time, at this point, it is an administration question. Councillor Cunningham. Chair, my question is to the Chair of the Community Arts and Lifestyle Committee, Councillor Maddock. Councillor Maddock, in this year's budget, the administration announced a series of outdoor cinema events to be held in our suburbs. Can you outline some of the highlights of this program and how well it has been received by the residents of Brisbane? Councillor Maddock. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair, and I thank the Councillor for the question uh, and to be able to speak on this important program initiated by the Lord Mayor, which is our, suburbs, uh, which is our Cinemas in the Suburbs program. 
Uh, Mr Chair, this is about this administration's commitment to more to see and do within our city. And as councillors within this chamber, we know the importance of when we put our movies in the park and how successful those programs are. Importantly, also, the community that we build through those events. And so it's fantastic to see that the Lord Mayor has invested uh, $221,000 in being able to provide 40 free movie screenings at different locations within this financial year to uh, get the message out there uh, to provide more activities to local residents and to continue to spread that strong sense of community. Um, we have already started to roll the program out. Uh, Mr Chair, uh, just last weekend there was the first one in your ward uh, and then, then we will continue to roll these out uh, throughout the months ahead uh, in, in wards across the city uh, so the benefit of all councillors, making sure that we pl place them in locations that all councillors can enjoy. The, uh, the, these uh, movies will also add value to the events that we already run. For many councillors, we run them in different forms and being able to provide uh, add-ons to these events. For some of us, it's uh, free popcorn, it's providing opportunities to our lines and our rotaries as far as sausage sizzles so that they can provide some community fundraising uh, as well and benefit from that. Uh, for some of them, it could be a jumping castle or other activity. All of these things uh, we will continue to do in the ordinary course as councillors, but what this opportunity uh, provi is provided to us by the Lord Mayor will add even further to that. We all know that the cost associated with putting the movies in our parks uh, can it sometimes be sizable. By being able to offset the cost through this investment, we can add further value so that we can utilise those fundings within our community funds for even more movies events or providing more funding for different community organisations. That's the value of what this does. And so this announcement by the Lord Mayor um, is such a great announcement for all of us in being able to make the dollar stretch even further. Mr Chair, uh, we know that uh, the officers will be working in conjunction uh, with ward officers around timings of different events. I know that with Halloween approaching, for example, there will be councillors holding movies uh, to uh, add value to the events they're already having, which is great to see. Halloween continues to grow and grow in popularity every year. Uh, and the opportunity for councillors to add value to local community events is so important. Importantly also, as we uh, lead up to the new year, there could be Christmas events uh, where we could, we could put on the appropriate movie uh, for residents to enjoy. So there is so many opportunities that exist, that exist within this program that the Lord Mayor is rolling out, uh, making sure that we continue to provide that outcome. Uh, Mr Chair, this is just another example of this administration's commitment to our communities and importantly to this program area of being able to provide more to see and do throughout our city by being able to provide those opportunities for engagement and working in collaboration with community organisations and with the community as well. By being able to do this, we will help um, also the various uh, cultural experiences that, that uh, councillors may be able to participate in the types of movies that they can provide. I know that, uh, for example, we have always worked through a list, but there are opportunities for appropriate movies in conjunction with our contractors to provide different varieties and different opportunities. And so I encourage all councillors to uh, engage with their contractors, uh, as they already have in many instances, to look for those opportunities of enhancing that experience by looking at movies uh, that uh, might be specific or uh, culturally specific to some of their wards, uh, but also the opportunities of bringing family together. Um, so as we start to roll these out, we hopefully will see even more opportunities. I certainly encourage um, um, councillors to um, uh, promote them, obviously, in the ordinary course, but certainly on the What's On page through council's website. And by being able to do this, uh, we will be able to uh, create those exciting opportunities for people to enjoy a beautiful uh, climate as we start to approach uh, summer. We will start to see uh, more opportunities for more activities uh, in those afternoons leading into movies and making sure that we're connecting uh, our communities together, bringing young and old uh, to our parks and providing those uh, opportunities for people to enjoy our great city and the outdoor experiences that it can bring. Thank you. Further questions? Councillor Shree. Thanks, Mr Chair. My question is to the Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, I've repeatedly raised with you the importance of completing the river walk between Mowbray Park in East Brisbane and the Dockside Precinct of Kangaroo Point. You've advised me in writing that rather than Council spending the money up front to complete that river walk in one go, that as each development along that river walk is um, approved, Council will complete those sections of the river walk uh, as part of those development application approval processes. 
But we've now seen that with the DA for 104 and 108 Lambert Street, Kangaroo Point, the developer is not completing the river, their section of Riverwalk and no money has been allocated to complete that section of Riverwalk. So can you confirm that the section of Riverwalk adjacent to 104 and 108 Lambert Street will be completed as part of the DA? And if not, when will it be completed? Uh, Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you for the question. Obviously, um, Councillor Sri knows that I am a big supporter of Riverwalk, um, being responsible for the construction and delivery of the New Farm Riverwalk, uh, and also kicking off the Botanic Gardens Riverwalk and uh, starting the work on the Indrapilly uh, Riverwalk. So uh, my commitment to Riverwalk, I think, uh, is quite clear and there for everyone to see. Uh, ultimately, though, um, when it comes to uh, missing sections of Riverwalk, um, we would uh, generally prefer to see them delivered um, through development as part of the development process. Uh, and that is generally our position. Uh, there are some cases though, which are individual uh, and unique cases where that is not possible. Now with the DA for 108 Lambert Street, Kangaroo Point, our council received a code accessible development application uh, for three 10 storey towers containing 200 units on a number of parcels of land uh, at that location. The site, like the rest of Kangaroo Point, has been identified for high density living for a number of decades uh, and it's code accessible as 10 storey development. Um, the 10 storey being the, the general sort of high density height limit, 10 storey or above. Uh, there is already an existing approval on part of the site for two residential towers, which was of order, Mr. Chair. A point of order to you, Councillor Shree. On relevance, the Mayor is avoiding the crux of the question, which is about when that section of Riverwalk will be completed and whether Council will complete it. Uh, Lord Mayor, my, my opinion was that the Lord Mayor was answering the question. It was a very detailed question and I anticipated a very detailed answer. So, uh, Lord Mayor. So, uh, essentially, my understanding is that an application has been lodged. Um, the developer doesn't propose to build the Riverwalk, uh, but there's no decision been made on that application, um, according to my understanding of the situation. So, um, as you know, there are differences between what someone might propose on a site and what the end outcome might be. And so it is quite often in this place where we see people claiming that council is going to allow this or that or the other based on a development proposal when in fact a decision hasn't actually been uh, made on that particular application. Um, so uh, in terms of uh, the um, uh, our uh, concerns that were raised in the information request on the 1st of October, uh, one of, and a quote from the information request, Brisbane's long-term infrastructure plan identifies riverfront land in this location to be acquired as a corridor park uh, as per table 10.3.1a of the Brisbane city plan uh, and to ensure this area is labelled on revised plans for that purpose uh, and is not pre prejudiced by built form. Now, one of the other issues that Councillor Shri should be aware of as well is that uh, there have been mixed results with the construction of private sections of uh, Riverwalk. And so uh, it has been the case, sadly, that um, some of the sections of Riverwalk that have been constructed privately um, have not experienced or had the longevity or flood resilience uh, that we would now anticipate. And so, for example, uh, there are a number of sections of Riverwalk along the city reach where we've had to spend literally uh, scores of millions of dollars upgrading the sections of Riverwalk that have been built by developers. Because one of the things that has happened over time has been that um, uh, the 2011 flood has very much um, caused us to take a different view to the resilience of infrastructure and the, the strength and design of that infrastructure. And often it is the best way uh, to build these facilities as we've seen with uh, the Botanic Gardens Riverwalk and the New Farm Riverwalk, that it's done as a single project to council standards as a whole. Having said this, we are absolutely determined to make sure that council 
requires uh, the section of land at the front of this site, or at the riverfront of this site, um, so that we have the ability to construct Riverwalk in the future. Uh, I, I suspect, though, that ultimately having a, a one single section of Riverwalk that doesn't actually connect into other sections is not the ideal outcome, uh, but it is Council's intention to connect Riverwalk uh, further along the river through there. And just like Councillor Shree desires, uh, we certainly would like to see a good uh, cycling and pedestrian connection through to Mowbray Park. That is something that we uh, share as a desire. But ultimately, this particular application is still under assessment. Uh, we are certainly moving to make sure that the land Lord on Mayor, the riverfront comes expired. into council ownership, which will allow us opportunities in the future. Councillor Owen. Uh, my question is to the Chair of Environment, Parks and Sustainability Committee, Councillor Hammond. Councillor Hammond, the transformation of Oxley Creek is well underway, including the recently commenced Adventure Park in the Heathwood Lara Printer precinct. Can you please update the Chamber on this exciting project? Councillor Hammond. Thank you, um, Councillor Owen, for the question. And I know that you have been involved in this pro um, program from the very beginning, and you've been working exceptionally well um, with the Oxley Creek Transformation Team and the board to help deliver this very exciting project. As you said, stage one of this new nature-based adventure parkland in Heathwood is now under construction and is due to open in 2020. The new parkland is the first priority project outcome from the Oxley Creek Transformation Master Plan, bringing life to the 20-year vision to transform the Oxley Creek Corridor to a world-class green lifestyle and leisure destination for Brisbane. This nature park is located on Paradise Road and is the first stage of the new parkland will provide the foundation for nature-based adventure and outdoor activity, including, which I'm really excited about, and I know you are as well, a nature-based playground incorporating water play, a lakeside walkway and jetty, picnic areas including shelters, barbecues and toilets, walking trails for wildlife and bird spotters, an internal car park with access from Paradise Road. On entering the parkland, residents and visitors will be greeted by views of the picturesque lake towards picnic areas nestled into the shoreland. You can wander along the lakeside, spot some fish from the new jetty, or learn more about the wildlife that call the parkland home. The new nature-based playground will provide a setting for children to create their own adventures and exploring. And I think I might um, do that with them as well because it sounds so exciting and so much fun. This will give the kids the, um, the, the ability to, for experiment, um, experimenting, building, developing their curiosity and imagination and physical skills. With plenty to fire the imagination, kids can race leaf boats. How many of us can remember doing that as children down the watercourse? Build a bush cubby or climb the bridge to the treehouse. Since the announcement of the <clears throat> by the previous Lord Mayor in 2016, the recognition of this project um, has had many awards. 2018, the Australian Urban Design Award was shortlisted for the Leadership, Advocacy and Research. City and Regional Scale Award, Planning Instrument um, Institute sorry, of Australia, Queensland Awards, Awards for Planning Excellence in the Best Planning Ideas for a Large Project in both 2018 and 2019. Got, received awards for excellence in the category of land management at the Queensland 2019 Australian Institute of Landscape Architecture and most recently, the National Award for Excellence in Land Management in 2019, Australian Institute of Landscape Architecture National Awards. I know and very proud to stand with this Lord Mayor as he is committed to achieving the incredible vision of Oxley Creek Corridor, revitalising one of the city's most urbanised waterways and creating a legacy world-class 20 kilometre parkland along Oxley Creek. Mr Chair, on this side of the chamber, 
we are working hard to create more to see and do for the residents and visitors by protecting and enhancing our green space and making this council Brisbane better. For the questions, Councillor Cassidy. Uh, thank you, Chair. My question is to the Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, how much of the $100,000 a year ratepayer funded slush fund you receive in weekly payments have been used on private holidays? Lord Mayor. This is just lame, uh, Mr. Chair. If he wants to know about it, he should ask Jim Surley or order. Tim Quinn because it's the same one that they had. A point of order to you, Councillor Cassidy. The, the, under, the, uh, under the meetings local law, um, the Lord Mayor is not uh, allowed to debate the question. He is required to answer the question, though. Uh, Lord Mayor, to, to the uh, question at hand, please. <laughs> well, I, I, look, I, I can't remember the last time I went on a private holiday, um, and certainly can't remember going on a private holiday since I was Lord Mayor. Um, so I, I don't know. I'm just speaking from memory here. Uh, I wish I had a holiday. Yes. Um, but you know, <laughs> well, um, yeah. Look, uh, I, yeah, I'm not aware of anything uh, like that, and I'm not aware of going on a private holiday any time recently. Other questions, Councillor Richards. Uh, my question is to the chair of the Public and Active Transport, Economic and Tourism Development Committee, Councillor Adams. Uh, Deputy Mayor, the Lord Mayor today announced a raft of initiatives to support small business in Brisbane, in addition to the many initiatives that are already underway. Can you please provide an update on how the Schroener administration is backing small business? Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr Chair. Thank you, Councillor Richards. Uh, Lord Mayor Adrian Schroener and myself as Economic Development Chair know that Brisbane is built on our local economy. And when local businesses are stronger, our local communities are stronger as well. There are 124,000 businesses in Brisbane and 97 per cent of those registered businesses are small businesses. 63 per cent of them are sole traders. So this side of the chamber and Councillor Toomey, Team Shrina, are absolutely passionately focused on making sure that small businesses thrive and contribute to that diverse economy. Very thrilled to announce today three exciting new initiatives that will bring the suburbs back to life while backing small business at the same time. They're going to help our small business owners feel less isolated, ready to tackle the challenges of starting, running and growing a business. The first one includes the Suburban Shopfront Program, which will inject $50,000 into the better use of local shopfronts. We know that there's many local retail precincts across Australia but also in Brisbane, that are struggling with vacancies. Empty shop fronts have an issue with our foot traffic and suburban life in our city neighbourhoods. So through this program, we're trying to encourage property owners to lease their unused space in the suburban retail precincts to emerging businesses. Pop-up usage will bring our suburbs to life, create more to see and do right across Brisbane. We're giving residents more opportunity to enjoy our beautiful climate and connect to friends and family in their local areas as well. We know statistics are not great when it comes to failure in the early years of starting a business. So we really want to give small business every chance of success right from the beginning. The Lord Mayor's Small Business Forums and Workshop are held throughout the year and they have been a remarkable success. More than 6,000 people have attended the forums and workshops since they began. And consistently we hear the same thing. Businesses want to network, they want to connect, and they want to share their experiences. So we have been listening. So the second one of our initiatives is a free monthly suburban network events throughout Brisbane. Small and home-based businesses who face many challenge and challenges, and among those, social isolation, will have an opportunity to uh, talk to others that are also putting in their blood, sweat and tears to make their businesses operate as well. And we want them to know that they're not alone um, and we are there to support them in their business. So this new series will continue to offer industry speakers access to information and help from council. We'll be launching a refreshed series of two-hour free intensive business training sessions. So we're looking at skill shot workshops. So these sessions will help small business owners to enhance their skills and capabilities in specific areas. So they could be business basics, they may be marketing, 
business development. They will be focused on developing real-world skills needed to run a successful business. And with so many sole traders, it's important to show small businesses that they are not alone. That is why we are offering these new opportunities to network and access training for micro-businesses, home businesses and new businesses. They'll be introduced over the coming months, adding to our existing suite of small business support services like the $2 million we have slashed worth of fees this year that impact our small businesses right across the suburbs of Brisbane. They include dining permits, food van licence, market store fees, advertising applications and many more. We are giving our businesses the best opportunity to survive that first 12 to 24 months. And we are talking the talk and walking the walk with our new local buy in our procurement policy as well, improving the chances of small businesses for getting work with the largest council in Australia as well. <coughs> Excuse me. Winning a contract with Brisbane City Council is a great benefit to so many businesses and one of the many ways that we are working hard to make sure that our time-poor businesses get all the skills that they need and the support from Brisbane City Council. Further questions? Councillor Johnston. Uh, yes, my question is to the Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, the stated purpose of Lenny and Group undertaking work at the McGregor Green in Yoronga is, in its own words, in the application to Council, and I quote, to enable future redevelopment of the McGregor Green, end of quote. Given Council's DA team has refused this development on the basis of the site's sporting and cultural history, and the Planning and Development Court has refused the development approval on the basis of the sporting and cultural histories of the 106-year-old site, why has Council backflipped with a triple somersault and a pike um, and is now facilitating massive destruction and development of a heritage-listed site zoned for sport and recreation, contrary to the decision of the Planning and Environment Court. Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Johnston. Uh, and, and I'm glad you asked this question because it provides an opportunity to put some actual facts on the That's table, right. as opposed to the rubbish being peddled in the media, the outrageous rubbish that we've seen, uh, which uh, unfortunately uh, some people seem to have bought hook, line and sinker. So let's put the facts on the table. Council received a development application on the site uh, on the 24th of May 2016. The application was for 50 units on land zone sport and recreation, land that was formerly part of the Yoronga Bowls Club and has been sold to another party. The application was impact accessible under the city plan and underwent public notification. Following an assessment in accordance with the state's Sustainable Planning Act and city plan, Council, uh, Council's independent planning officers refused the development application on the 9th of December 2016. The applicant chose to appeal the court's decision to the Planning and Environment Court, uh, and I understand others, including Councillor Johnson, chose to join Council as co-respondents. Following the normal procedures of the Planning and Environment Court uh, and, the trial, and a trial, the court ruled in favour of Council on the 26th of April this year and upheld the decision to refuse the application. Since that time, the owner of the former Bowls Club Green has chosen to lodge a heritage exemption certificate with Council. For those who aren't aware, the State Government's Queensland Heritage Act 1992 allows local governments to issue heritage exemption certificates to owners of places identified as being of local cultural heritage significance. Heritage exemption certificates are not intended to deal with major changes or complex developments, but to cover work which will have no more than a minimal impact on the heritage significance of a local heritage place. In this instance, the owners of the former Bowls Green, in partnership with the Yoronga Bowls Club, relocating some minor heritage items from the former Bowls Green to the Yoronga Bowls Club site as well as removing some non-heritage items. In fact, the heritage impact assessment that was lodged with Council states it was the Yoronga Bowls Club itself who were proposing to relocate the heritage items back onto its site. That's right. To quote directly from the heritage impact assessment, 
Consistent with the situation of many bowls clubs in Australia, Yeronga Bowls Club is no longer financially and practically viable in its current context. Count Councillor, the Councillor Johnston, Councillor Johnston, you, you're, you've interjected for much of this answer. Um, some of the things you've said are disproportionate and uh, not becoming of, of the standards we'd hope in for in this place. Um, uh, I appreciate it's a sensitive topic, but please allow the Lord Mayor to answer the question. Lord Mayor. It goes on to say, and I'm, and I'm quoting from the Heritage Impact Assessment, the majority of clubs are struggling Councilor to address. Councillor Johnston, I, just, I, just, I appreciate that this is a, an important matter to you, but, but please allow the Lord Mayor to answer the question, provide this information. Sounds Lord like Mayor. Councillor Johnston is trying to stifle debate in this, in this place. <laughs> The uh, majority of clubs are struggling to attract and retain bowling members, and many of the smaller clubs, like Yeronga Bowls Club, are closing or amalgamating with larger clubs with enhanced facilities. Yeronga Bowls Clubs uh, are using the proceeds of sale of the study area in order to promote and maintain the playing of lawn bowls, organising social functions and other appropriate programs. Importantly, the club can now renovate the clubhouse and attract other recreational opportunities that occur in the club uh, at all hours including uh, karate, dance and Pilates. The transition from the former McGregor Green into private ownership requires the Yeronga Bowls Club to relocate the heritage elements remaining within the study area onto land that the Yeronga Bowls Club owns so that these assets can remain within the club's control. The current owner of the study area has agreed to allow Yeronga Bowls Club to relocate these elements from their, uh, from their land as soon as required. So, if you believe what's been portrayed by Councillor Johnston in the media, it's the absolute destruction of heritage. What's happening here is heritage elements are being relocated to the Bowls Club to be preserved. So this is a dishonest approach that we've seen here, completely misrepresenting the facts, going for the sensational headline and the media story, uh, but completely neglecting the facts. This wasn't some kind of. This wasn't some kind of. Councillor Johnston, as you are well aware, I don't mind the occasional interjection, but but please refrain from repeating yourself and saying the same thing over and over again. You know, uh, interjections here are a part of life, but to, just to repeat yourself again and again is a, is a little tedious. And please refrain, Lord Mayor. So this wasn't so, some so-called greedy developer laying pillage to a her to a heritage site. This was the former owner, the Bowls Club, relocating the heritage to their own site. Now, council rightly allowed that relocation to occur, as we should. It's about preserving heritage. Now, ultimately, we expect that this heritage will be and should be preserved. And we expect the reinstatement of the heritage items as well. And that is what uh, we expect to happen. But Councillor Johnson, uh, sadly, Lord Mayor, your has misrepresented has the facts here. Further questions? Councillor Mackay. Thank you, Chair. My question is to the Chair of the Finance and Administration Committee, Councillor Allen. Councillor Allen, over the recess, this administration introduced a rates remission to first home buyers to help them crack into the property market and provide relief when they need it most. Can you outline how the Schrinner administration is making it easier for residents to buy their first home in Brisbane? Can Councillor Allen. Thank you, Mr Chair, and thank you, uh, Councillor Mackay, for the question. Well, uh, spring is undoubtedly a very popular time to buy a house in Australia. It is turning out to be a particularly great time to buy a house in Brisbane, with the first homeowner's rates remission now available. This remission is committed to making the Brisbane of tomorrow even better than the Brisbane of today. We are making Brisbane even better with the introduction of our first homeowners rates remission, which started at the beginning of this month. As part of the program, first homeowners in Brisbane will receive a remission of 50% of their first year of council rates up to a value of $1,000. So for some homeowners, this can mean savings of $1,000 in the first year of home ownership. And as uh, those of you who know, uh, buying a first home can be a pretty taxing time. 
the, uh, the financial stress is, uh, is evident. Uh, you have to <laughs> rustle up a deposit. You have to uh, gather funds together for a stamp duty. And then there's a list of additional costs like application fees, legal fees and search fees. So the financial costs are uh, evident. And then, lo and behold, once you decide to move to your new home, you've got costs such as moving, uh, removalist fees, cleaning, and in some cases even the cost of breaking a lease. So uh, the costs in owning your first home mount up and are significant and obviously are, are most critical in that first year. And this particular remission is uh, designed to try and ease those uh, first year woes. Now, we, uh, we recognise that uh, a lot of people um, have an aspiration to, uh, to move into uh, home ownership. Owning uh, a home in Australia has been a very popular part of our, uh, our, our culture and ethos for, for, for many years. Um, certainly there is a cross-section of our community who prefer not to, but uh, for the vast majority of young people, home ownership is still uh, an ambition. So Brisbane remains a, a hot spot for uh, home ownership in Australia. Certainly our properties here are, are more affordable and we have a diversity in housing options in Brisbane which ensure that uh, people have choice, that there is uh, a competitive pricing environment and that properties remain affordable. And in fact, 42% of Brisbane suburbs offer median property prices under $500,000. So it's no surprise that 1,300 people per month are choosing to move to Brisbane and call Brisbane home. The remission will apply to any purchases under $750,000. Unlike other first homeowner incentives, it does not matter if the property is new or established. It only matters that the property transferred occurred after the 1st of October and we encourage residents who believe they may qualify to visit the council website to check their eligibility and the conditions of the remission. Our rates remission and the recent announcement by the Reserve Bank to again reduce rates to below 1% have made home ownership a real prospect for a lot of first home buyers. With the Reserve Bank cash rate now under 1%, interest rates remain at a historically low level and the opportunity to buy a home has probably never been better. I urge all councillors to convey the benefits of this remission to their residents. Uh, we need to get the message out there. We really want uh, first home buyers to uh, uh, take up this offer and I'll leave further debate to the Chamber. That concludes question time. Councillors, I draw to your attention the reports, in particular the consideration of the recommendations of the Establishment and Coordination Committee during the spring recess, uh, the spring recess 2019 on matters usually considered by uh, the ENC. Mr. Lord Chair, uh, I move the report of the recommendations of the Establishment and Coordination Committee during the spring recess 2019 on matters usually considered by that committee be adopted. Uh, it's been moved uh, by the Lord Mayor, uh, seconded by the Deputy Mayor, the report of the recommendation of the Establishment and Coordination Committee meeting during the spring uh, recess of 2019 on matters usually considered by that committee be adopted. Is there any debate? Lord Mayor. Uh, yes, um, Mr Chair. Well, it has been uh, an interesting few weeks. I particularly liked all of the fireworks around river fire time. And I'm not talking about on the river, I'm talking about uh, in the Labor Party. Right. My favourite part of river fire was always the F-111 dump and burn. And we've seen the Labor Party revive the dump and burn this year on river fire night by canning their candidate and canning their leader of the opposition. It is absolutely unprecedented that we have seen such a rabble of an opposition that knife their own candidate six months out from an election. And it's fascinating because when you hear, when you hear Councillor Cassidy's comments earlier, uh, uh, personal attacks on myself, um, and apparently uh, he thinks I'm doing an appalling job. I'm not the one getting knifed and rolled. I'm not the one getting booted out. So if I'm doing such a bad job, why am I still here 
when Rod Harding's not and Councillor Cumming is not. The reality is Labor is absolutely a disunited mess with no plans for the city, with no vision, no policies and no idea about how to run a city, how to run Australia's largest city council. Interestingly enough, though, uh, we come into council today and, as I said before, it's Councillor Cassidy's first day in school. He's got his socks pulled up. He's ready uh, to put on a performance, make some new friends. Unfortunately, on the two motions that we saw today, he completely mishandled and botched those. I have never seen... I, I, look, I, I, I must admit, in, in predicting what Labor might do to these motions, in response to these motions, I would never have predicted that Labor would back a councillor calling the Queensland Police Service violent and racist. I would have never predicted that they would be that stupid and that politically naive to do something like that. And moreover, given their claimed concern about ratepayer funds, I would never have predicted that they would back Extinction Rebellion over the people of Brisbane. But they have done both of those things today. And as I said, uh, two strikes, a third uh, and he's out. It has been sadly uh, not a good day for Councillor Cassidy because it started badly with a knifing from Minister Hinchcliffe. Minister Hinchcliffe, Cassidy's mate, Cassidy's best mate, said, don't worry, Jared, I'll get you there. You don't need any policies. You don't need any vision. Keep dishing the dirt. Keep digging the dirt. Keep throwing the mud. We'll get you elected. We're going to rig the system in your favour. I promise you, Jared, we'll do it for you. You don't have to do anything. Keep dishing the dirt. And then there was the phone call this morning from Minister Hinchliffe. Uh, sorry, Jared. I've been rolled by the Premier. My secret plan, actually, it wasn't that secret. My plan to get you elected has been overturned by the Premier. And I have to commend the Premier for a sensible outcome here. The Premier has made the right decision, the sensible one. And you know what? Uh, my estimation of the, the Premier and her ability to make a decision uh, has increased massively today. And now we are looking forward to her intervening in the same way to get out of the way of Brisbane Metro, to overturn her incompetent minister, Mark Bailey's game playing when it comes to Metro so that we can get on with the job. Why? Because it benefits the Labor state government as well if we're getting on with Metro. It benefits all of the people of Brisbane and indeed all of the people of South East Queensland. And they would see that if they had any political nous, that they would get out of the way of Metro, get on board, so that, you know what, I'll invite Premier Palaszczuk down to the sod turning for Metro. She can stand there with me, turn the first sod, and we can get on with it. And just like she's listened on the issue of compulsory preferential voting, throwing out that rotten idea, she needs to step in and intervene with her incompetent minister, Mark Bailey, and help us get on with Brisbane Metro. It's a fully funded project. We're keen to get on with it. We're moving forward with procurement. Work can start within weeks, and we urge the Premier to get on board. I look forward to working with the Premier constructively and positively going forward. We're off to a good start with today's sensible decision, and overruling incompetent ministers is a good start today. She needs to do it again. Uh, with Mark Bailey, uh, and then we can get some real progress for the people of Brisbane. Uh, we will continue to focus on our positive plans and projects for the city. We will continue to move forward on Brisbane Metro, on Victoria Park, on the five green bridges, on the Green Future Fund, on creating new parklands, on saving bushland. We will continue to do those things that we're passionate about. And I hope Labor will realise that throwing mud is not enough, that digging the dirt is not enough. Because I know uh, from being around in politics for a little while that when you start talking about salary and allowances and superannuation, you've got nothing, especially when it was a system that you brought in as a party, especially when you've been collecting the paychecks for so long without saying a peep, without saying a peep. And especially when the only person in this chamber 
the only one person in this chamber to vote for 20 per cent super is sitting on that side of the chamber and his name is Councillor Peter Cumming. He voted for it. Oh, he's left. He's left. The reality is Labor's got nothing for the people of Brisbane. They've got no plans, no substance, and all they have is a plan to dish the dirt, a plan to throw the mud, a plan for personal attacks, and the people of Brisbane are already seeing right through that. And changing leaders won't change anything if you continue to take such a negative, uh, destructive, personal approach to the job that you're doing. And so my gratuitous advice is the best thing you can do to get some credibility is to actually stop dishing the dirt, pick up the phone to Premier Palaszczuk and get her to approve Metro. If you do that, you know what? I'll even put you in my cabinet. <laughs> Councillor Cassidy, you can have a seat at the cabinet table. If you do that, uh, that will be a good outcome because we'll be working together for a positive uh, future for the city of Brisbane. We'll be working together uh, to make sure that those buses that are currently full on the busway are actually supplemented. <laughs> the, the buses that are full on the busway will have new metro services turning up every three minutes in peak, every five minutes during the day and every 10 minutes at night. That's what will make a difference, not personal attacks, dishing the dirt and throwing mud. Mr Chairman, uh, we have a number of items uh, before us today. Uh, but before I go on to those, I will just briefly touch on uh, the lighting of uh, council assets, uh, which uh, includes uh, this week, the Story Bridge, Brisbane City Hall and Radcliffe Place, uh, lit up in a colour scroll to celebrate the INAS Global Games that are happening here in Brisbane. And this is a great event for the city because it is not only a, an incredibly important elite sporting event, but is a sporting event that supports and encourages our vision for an inclusive city, for a city where everyone can participate. And uh, INAS, as people would probably be aware, are a game specifically for athletes with an intellectual impairment. And so these, these men and women, uh, these boys and girls participating are incredible athletes that can perform absolutely at the highest international levels. Uh, and it is fantastic to see them here in uh, Brisbane. Uh, and uh, it was good to share the stage uh, with the Premier uh, just a couple of days ago to officially open the games. So we have a thousand athletes here in Brisbane uh, participating and competing throughout the, the week uh, and supporting an inclusive uh, Brisbane uh, so that people of uh, all abilities can participate and uh, achieve amazing things. Uh, on Wednesday, the Victoria Bridge will be lit orange in support of the State Emergency Services Week. Uh, and obviously in the lead up to summer uh, and the summer season in Brisbane, uh, the State Emergency Services are some, uh, they're, they're someone or, or an organisation that we all appreciate and respect. We all hope we don't need to use their services, but we certainly appreciate that they're there, uh, staffed by volunteers, ready to help in times of need. And that also reminds me as well uh, about the Get Ready for Summer campaign, uh, which we launch, uh, launched jointly with the Lord state Mayor, government. Your time has expired. Move for an extension. Uh, an extension of time has been moved, has been moved by the, uh, the Deputy Mayor and by Councillor Hammond. All those in favour say aye. 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 The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Lord Mayor, please continue. Uh, uh, Mr Chair, the, uh, the Get Ready for Summer campaign that we launched jointly with the state government uh, just yesterday in King George Square. And this is all about making sure that residents are aware uh, of the upcoming storm season. They sign up to our early warning uh, alerts so they can get emails and SMSs depending on their choice. Uh, they can check to make sure that they've got their emergency plan in place, uh, that they've got uh, the, the torch is ready to go. They've got radios with batteries in them. They've also got their insurance updated. And more importantly as well, that they've cleaned up their yard uh, and we're providing free green waste tipping at our transfer stations this week uh, for residents across the city to get rid of their green waste and clean up their, uh, their backyard. This is the third 
uh, free green waste tipping weekend we've had already in the lead up to summer. Uh, and we encourage residents to take advantage of that and get involved. And it's certainly something that we're working very closely with the state government on uh, and the different state government agencies, including the Queensland Fire and Emergency Services, the Rural Fire Brigade, Energex, uh, the Queensland Police, and many different agencies uh, that are involved in helping uh, in the lead up to the summer season. In terms of the reports before us, uh, item A is the Archerfield Wetlands Precinct Plan. And uh, as we've heard from uh, Councillor Fiona Hammond before, the whole Oxley Creek corridor is just such an exciting and massive opportunity for our city. And one that the community is only starting to become aware of. And as they're becoming aware of it, they're getting really excited because it is truly a transformative opportunity for the city to create a real one-of-a-kind green leisure and recreation destination. And it's sad that the local councillor doesn't support such a positive project. It really is. Um, because the Archerfield Wetlands Precinct Plan uh, is an important component in that whole Oxley Creek transformation project. Uh, and uh, that is why that is why we put more than $5 million in the budget for this particular project uh, out at Archerfield this year. Now, um, Councillor uh, Johnston always likes to say there's no money ever going anywhere near her area. Um, oh, oh, it's not in her, it's not in her ward. Um, I said anywhere near her area. And it's funny because it's just down the road uh, from the bus depot that um, she didn't want either. So when it, when it comes to investment in her area, she poo-poos it. Uh, when it comes to investment that will benefit her residents, she poo-poos it. Uh, but that's all right. We're not going to be deterred by her negativity. We will persist and go ahead. Uh, let's see how that goes next time, Councillor Cassidy. Let's see how that goes next time. <laughs> oh, was that Councillor Griffiths, was it? Um, yeah, we'd all, like, um, we'd all like that situation to happen with our opponent. Um, but good luck next time, Councillor Johnston. Uh, so community feedback we received on the draft precinct plan earlier this year was incorporated into the plan uh, and the inclusion of a one kilometre long discovery trail, a canoe and kayak destination and the provision for cultural and interpretive experiences has been incorporated. And so I'd like to thank the community for their impact, <laughs> input and also the Oxley Creek transformation team for the amazing work that they've done. Uh, item B is the contracts and tendering report for August 2019, uh, and uh, we've seen here a range of different contracts. Uh, in particular, I wanted to uh, point out uh, the uh, work that was progressing uh, when it comes to Brisbane Metro and the appointment of accessibility and inclusion advisory services to the Brisbane Metro project. Uh, and that is obviously an important part of the project to make sure it is accessible uh, for people of all abilities so that people can easily access high quality turn up and go public transport uh, that gets them where they need to go. And so uh, we're moving forward uh, receiving that adv advice which is critical to making the project the best it possibly can be. <coughs> Item C uh, is the significant contracting plan for the construction of the South Bank and Howard Smith Wars ferry terminals. Uh, and this is also something that I'm really excited about. Uh, we uh, obviously have been upgrading a number of terminals across the city. Uh, the Howard Smith Wharves terminal, though, uh, will be a brand new facility uh, and it will provide for that absolutely booming precinct which Council has created at Howard Smith Wharves. Uh, and uh, just every time you go to Howard Smith Wharves, you just see how many people are enjoying that precinct from all corners of the city, how popular it is. And we want to make sure that people can get there more easily uh, on high quality public transport, like our city cats or our ferries. And so we're building a new terminal at Howard Smith Wharves. We're also upgrading uh, probably uh, two of the busiest terminals in the network at South Bank. Uh, and we're moving forward with that critical upgrade as well. Uh, and so construction for both terminals will begin uh, in the new year. I think that's it for the current report. <laughs> Thank you for the extension of time.
Further speakers, Councillor Cassidy. Thank you, Chair, and I um, thank the Lord Mayor for attempting to bribe me uh, with an inducement. Um, um, people in uh, Parliament have been referred to, uh, um, to the Ethics Committee and the Triple C over things like that, so I certainly appreciate the Lord Mayor um, trying to, trying, trying to uh, get me to do his work for him. I say, uh, Lord Mayor, sort out your metro mess yourself, because it is your mess. Um, and I think you know the, the Lord Mayor's Lord Mayor's attack on me, uh, Chair, was um, fun and entertaining. And I think um, I think uh, Paul Keating summed it up best. And this applies to our Lord Mayor here. Uh, here's a shiver looking for a spine to run up. Uh, I would just ask that item B be taken seriatim for voting, please, Excuse me. Chair. O item B for voting alone. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, on contracts and tendering, uh, we see uh, a few interesting um, items in here. Uh, 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 contract number six, community and engage, uh, communication and engagement services. This is quite an extraordinary uh, contract, uh, uh, six million dollars worth of schedule of rates, and you can see here a whole heap of providers uh, um, receiving hundreds of thousands of ratepayer dollars for communication services uh, and com com uh, corporate communications. Uh, and this is just a, a very clear example, Chair, of how so out of touch uh, this administration has got uh, when you have to pay uh, private companies millions and millions of dollars uh, to, talk to, the, um, to talk to the community. That should be something that uh, Council does as core business, you would imagine. Uh, but this administration has gotten uh, so bloated uh, and so out of touch that they have to pay $6 million uh, to private companies to do that communication uh, on their behalf. And paying spin doctors uh, is probably uh, the better way of describing that, uh, because what we see is not uh, engagement when it comes to these corporate comms. Uh, they are an exercise for this Lord Mayor to put his face onto brochures, onto 10 or 11 million brochures a year and stuff them into letterboxes. So it is not community engagement. Uh, it is spin doctors uh, telling a particular story at the Lord Mayor's whim. And that says uh, all you need to know about how this administration treats community engagement. Uh, the first contract, the lease and operation of the cafe, the engine room, uh, lo located at 71 Macquarie Street, Tenerife, uh, it's good to see this sorry, sorry saga is finally uh, being wrapped up after we saw uh, what was exposed uh, as a, a so-called charity, uh, having uh, received the original contract, uh, never carrying out uh, what they were supposed to have done, uh, and uh, this facility that the community should have been uh, enjoying uh, being left idle for far, far too long. Now on the uh, item uh, C, Stores Board submission for significant contracting plan for the construction of the South Bank and Howard Smith Wharves ferry terminals. The last time we saw a major ferry terminal uh, contract go out uh, under this Lord Mayor's watch when he was the then chair of the Public uh, and Active Transport Committee, we saw uh, that ferry terminal at, uh, at New Farm uh, uh, made in China. Now, uh, I certainly hope uh, that um, that this, uh, uh, this contract will actually lead to jobs here in Brisbane uh, rather than offshoring those jobs to prefab, uh, prefab those uh, elements of those ferry terminals, <laughs> ship them out uh, and construct them here. Because we have uh, more than enough companies here in Brisbane or in South East Queensland, but definitely here in Brisbane, that can do this work. Uh, we always hear the Lord Mayor in his uh, previ previous role talk about how it is far too expensive to construct things here in Brisbane, uh, and it is little wonder when the Brisbane City Council, the largest uh, council in Australia, uh, is doing local businesses out of work and out of capacity to do work competitively because we're offshoring those jobs, those construction jobs, uh, those manufacturing jobs uh, to companies in China to prefabricate ferry terminals over there. Uh, and in more recent times, we've had the Lord Mayor pay lip service to local procurement and local buy. Uh, so we uh, call on this administration to ensure that these ferry terminals are constructed here in Brisbane. And we actually put our money where our mouth is uh, and ensure that we are supporting local industry, uh, jobs here in Brisbane instead of in Beijing. 
Further speakers? Mm. Councillor Johnston. Uh, yes, just briefly on... Um, Oh, well, I'll try and do all three. We'll see how we go. Um, but firstly, with respect to um, the Archfield Wetlands Precinct Plan, um, our Lord Mayor seems to be a little bit uninformed about where this is. That's, that's the first problem. So he seems to think it's in my ward and somehow I've been critical uh, of this, um, but that's not actually the case. It's in Maruka Ward. Uh, I think it'll then go to Forest Lake Ward uh, and it's not coming anywhere near Tennyson Ward. So, number one, Lord Mayor, if you're going to have a go at me, um, I would suggest you need to make sure you know what you're talking about before you do it. Uh, number two, um, I've not been opposed to uh, the Oxley Creek transformation project uh, per se. What I have concerns with, and it's clearly documented in all of my submissions, which are in writing, which I'm sure you could read if you could ever be bothered, um, is the emphasis that is being placed on development in this extremely degraded catchment. Um, the first and most important aspect of um, ensuring this is a place that people want to visit is restoring the habitat and the biodiversity of the Oxley Creek catchment in Brisbane City Council. Now, that is not happening. Now, you don't even have to take my word for it. Um, because this is not in my ward, I've not been involved uh, in it per se. I've been watching what's happening, and I presume this is a similar process that will roll out when it does come down to my ward. But, Lord Mayor, if you're not aware, um, I'm going to run you through some of the elements of feedback about this. And um, not unsurprisingly, I listened to my residents. Clearly, they've got the same level of concerns that Councillor uh, Griffith's residents have and they've expressed them to council. So I'm going to say this. Um, this council uh, got nine written submissions about the Archfield Wetlands Plan. Nine. That's it. There were 144 responses to an online survey. Um, so council is going out uh, on the basis of having nine written um, submissions. Uh, the council goes on to talk about how important unique web page views are um, but let me tell you, even I looked several times um, about things. So um, there is a problem here uh, that um, nine written submissions and 144 online surveys, no doubt push polls with respect to how the information should uh, be provided to council in a structured way, um, were, were done. So let me be clear. What were the big issues that the residents raised? Um, one of the key issues that residents raised concerns about was the balance between the community and recreational outcomes with the biodiversity, habitat values and functionality of the wetlands. It is obvious to anybody who lives along this corridor that the most important thing you can do um, to improve Oxley Creek is to improve um, the quality of the waterway corridor itself, which gets a D or a D minus rating which um, on all councils' um, uh, reports on contaminants in the creek, which happens not far away at Cliveton Avenue at the testing location, is, um, it's usually high transmission of illness or sickness. That's the quality of the water in this creek. Um, there is significant habitat that's been degraded. There is uh, significant biodiversity issues with flora and fauna in this area because the creek is not being well maintained. Council's only response to this in, in all of my years that have been here, I've got lots of really great hardworking bush care groups, um, lovely people who go out there and they're doing council's work. They're still the only people out there doing the work. Um, and they are planting trees and trying to weed, and there might be half a dozen of them each time. Um, yes, council gives them a bit of mulch. Yes, council does this. But council, in my time, in my ward, has made no effort to do anything with respect to Oxley Creek, and I've been asking. Um, it's clear to me uh, that the fundamental priority here has to be restoration of the waterway corridor. Oxley Creek is the largest tributary of the Brisbane River. When it spews polluted water into the Brisbane River, that's not a good thing, and that is happening every day. Um, but what is this council doing? It is pushing ahead with development in these locations 
rather than environmental rehabilitation. Um, this is fundamentally what I have said since this project started, and I will continue to say you have put the cart before the horse. Um, there is no point in attracting people to an environment that is toxic, um, that is degraded, um, that if people get in the water, the recommendation from Council's own website is there is a high risk of the transmission of illness. That is not um, an appropriate way uh, to attract people to use our outdoor spaces. Um, I support uh, certainly a lot of what uh, needs to happen on, along the Oxley Creek corridor, um, but what is a concern to me is um, that this council is pushing ahead with the development opportunities first. And one of the key themes that came out of the master plan was the importance of restoring the health of the waterway corridor itself. To, to, from what I can see, there's been no steps taken to do that. Now, in the report itself, it gets even more interesting when you look at uh, what's happening here. And yes, there's wonderful images of the Great Facilities Council's building. And then there are, there are comments like this, ongoing sustainability. Um, Oxley Creek will seek opportunities to generate revenue and funding for the parkland's ongoing management and experience. Um, uh, so we're just looking at revenue raising out of our council parks. Um, the uh, council also goes on to talk about uh, the importance of uh, looking after the habitat, but they don't say how it's going to be done. They don't say where the money's coming from. They don't say who's going to do it. Uh, restoration and enhancement activities. Um, uh, it talks about environmental restoration and enhancement will uh, both reinstate natural systems, improve wetland function, um, designated wetland conservation area. Um, work to rehabilitate the land will be progressively undertaken. Who's doing it? Why is there no list in here of what the objectives are? Who's undertaking the work? Is it just going to be we're asking our volunteers to do it? Because if that's what we're going to do here, it's not enough. That's what they do now. They work so hard. Um, this document um, may have some good ideas in it, but the key is how it is going to be delivered and who is responsible for it. Is the Oxley Creek Transformation Project going to pay for the ongoing environmental stewardship of this land in future? It doesn't say that. Or is it going to fall back to council who do nothing? And then it's going to fall back to the bush care groups uh, to do the work as it is now. So the lack of clarity in this document is a problem. Um, the lack of detail about what is going to happen is a problem. And the lack of focus on ensuring the rehabilitation and the restoration of the waterway corridor first, and then bringing people to a safe, clean, natural environment, that should come second. Thank you, Mr Chair. I stand to speak on item C, the significant contracting plan for the construction of South Bank and Howard Smith Wharf Ferry Channels. Um, the item we have today seeks approval to procure and construct the new Howard Smith Wharves and South Bank terminals. Um, last year, Council announced that in partnership with the Howard Smith Wharves um, Corporation that we'd be adding a brand new terminal to the ferry network, bringing the total to 26. Um, we recognise the roaring success that Howard Smith Wharves has been. It has been a welcome addition to the city, and we just remind people it was when Kate Jones was the Minister of Environment that they said no to Howard Smith Wharves. But glad to see that Minister Jones has changed her tune now and is down there making Lovely. sure she's celebrating Lovely. the wonderful tourism opportunities. <laughs> Having said this, the closest ferial terminals to Howard Smith Wharves are <coughs> over 700 metres to Riverside. Sydney City Street Ferry Channel over a kilometre away. So I think it is exactly within the parameters and with its popularity a great opportunity to get around and have more to see and do on our riverways. We want to ensure that they have people have quick and easy access to all of our Brisbane's greatest assets. And of course, if you're a senior, you can travel off peak from Monday to Friday free on those um, those city cats as well. And the Howard Smith Walls will be a great addition to that as well. 
We're also delivering an upgrade at the South Bank Ferry Terminal. Um, we have done South Bank Ferry Terminal 2, so we have got uh, the process of a terminal that can be used while we're in the construction phase of South Bank. Both terminals are now in design phase. They include new gangway walks down to the floating pontoon. They will be fully DDA compliant, in line with all the federal government requirements, and construction will begin in 2020. We do know that the patronage on our city cats is continuing to grow with over 5 million trips each year, and with the addition of new terminals, we are anticipating this trend to continue. With the uh uh, with regards to Councillor Cassidy's comments around procurement, this is about how many people we can employ in Brisbane, and anything that is being built in Brisbane is employing Brisbaneites to work on it. So we welcome the opportunity um, that this procurement process actually gives us, and we look forward to being able to deliver more to see and do and easier ways to get to it in the coming years. Further speakers? Councillor Griffiths. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I won't take long. I just wanted to uh, get up and support item A, which is Archfield Wetlands uh, Precinct Plan. Um, the, uh, there was a one-month consultation done, um, and uh, I believe that it covered a number of issues for local residents, certainly that I residents that I deal with. Um, we have to remember at the moment that the Archfield wetlands is, um, is as Councillor Johnston said, significantly degraded. It is our largest, um, our largest catchment, um, but it, it has been significantly degraded over, over Brisbane's history, particularly by sand mining and, and um, also industrial uses of that particular um, part of Brisbane. This, um, this project, which goes over 20 years, seeks to redress some of that at the same time that significant uh, corridor development is happening um, in terms of suburban growth, uh, particularly in um, the suburbs I represent, such as Pilar and so forth. So um, we've got the two things happening side by side. I think that makes a lot of sense. I think investing in park infrastructure makes a lot of sense. I think in improving um, this corridor in terms of the environment and in terms of the health, no, the Brisbane River, but the health of the bay makes sense. So I'm supportive of those things. Um, as I said, the area is growing, and one of the things that is happening at the moment is the Ipswich motorway um, from Rockley to Dara is actually being upgraded significantly, being made, uh, I believe, four lanes either way. Um, with that particular upgrade, there's also additional work that is impacting on this wetlands as well. Um, so that impact is there and it is occurring. I believe the two organisations um, are trying to manage that. Council and um, Department of Man uh, Transport Main Roads are seeking to, to manage that and mitigate um, any negativity in relation to that. Just in relation to resident feedback, uh, I, I represent the largest of AO home, I believe, in Australia, and that's out at Durack. I had meetings or went to meetings out there with residents. There were concerns about um, how close some of the pathways were coming to their particular residents. They were concerned about crime. We were able to find a solution to that, and I, I thank um, uh, the people who did the consultation for that. So that was dealt with. The other thing uh, was uh, another part of Durack. There's um, a number of residents in the neighbourhood watch are very concerned about um, the fact that we're going to do a canoe launching pad that was going to impact on their area. Uh, we've managed to relocate that pad and um, reduce some of their concerns about traffic and parking and so forth. Um, and while we've done that now, we have the opportunity in the future to go back and revise that should, should their attitude change in the future. So I believe the, uh, the consultation has been good. They've listened to residents um, and it will produce good outcomes for the community. Finally, the last thing we, that hasn't been mentioned today is that Oxley Creek Catchment Association potentially will get a new site uh, that will be in the old um, Anala Wastewater Treatment Facility that will be renovated for a park as well. So I, I believe, and I understand that is how we're progressing, it makes sense to give them a permanent home, a decent home, um, if we're going to build a partnership with them over the years. So, yeah. so overall, a good project. I support it, um, and um, they have listened to residents. Okay, thank you. 
First speakers, Councillor Hammond. Thank you, Mr Chair. I rise in favour of item A, the Archerfield Wetlands Precinct Plan, um, which establishes the vision, priority actions and improvements to this neglected, misused piece of land. Let us remember the history, as Councillor Griffiths um, said. The wetlands used to be an industrial precinct and was home to a wastewater treatment and waste disposal plant. I would also like to thank Councillor Griffiths for um, correcting the myths, mistruths of um, the councillor for Tennyson to say that there was consultation um, and that you were heavily involved with that, councillor. Point Griffiths. of order, Mr. Chairman. Point of order to you, um, councillor Johnston. Claim to be misrepresented. It's noted. I'll call on you at the end, councillor Hammond. Clearly. Um, remember her saying that there was no consultation or very little consultation. So, Councillor Griffiths, again, I would like to thank you for your input and talking to your local residents um, about their issues with the bikeways, walkways that are all part of this um, project and with the canoe and kayak launch facilities um, and that you acknowledge that um, Council did listen and moved that launching pad from that location to another location. I would also like to remind everybody that communities are not defined by electoral boundaries. They are not. So it is very interesting that Councillor Johnson says her residents are not going to get any benefit out of this. So, Councillor Griffiths, I encourage you. Point of order. Point of order, Councillor Johnson. Claim to be misrepresented. Uh, I've, I've noted it already, but I'll call on you for That's both. That's a different one. Uh, Councillor Hammond. I encourage you, Councillor Griffiths, to remind people of the good Tennyson ward people there that they are allowed to cross that electoral boundary, which is not too far away, to enjoy this beautiful green space that this side of the chamber is delivering. I would also like to correct the record where Councillor Johnson says that no one talks to her about this. This is simply not true. Point of order. Point of order again, Councillor Johnson. Uh, claim to be misrepresented. Because I know the board um, of the Oxley Creek transformation meets with um, the councillor for Tennyson, Councillor Griffiths, and Councillor Angela Owen to keep them updated on this wonderful project. Let us re um, remember this is 150 hectares of underutilised green space in a one of a kind, bring it all together for a one in a kind recreational area, which will be opened up to all of Brisbane's residents and our visitors to this great city. I'd also like to correct the record when Councillor Johnson mentioned that. Um, it's her, the Oxley Creek Catchment Association are not in contact or they don't seem to be kept up to board um, with Point what's of order. happening with this project. Claim to be misrepresented. I didn't mention Oxley Creek Catchment Association at okay. all. This oh. is like, I don't know what she thinks I said, oh, right, but it's okay. ridiculous now. No, thank, thanks, Councillor Johnston. As I said, um, the misrepresentations will be dealt with in, in one thing at the end of the uh, presentation. Which is, part, which is part of the volunteers that she refers to um, that aren't kept up to date. I can assure the people of the chamber that the Oxley Creek transformation continues to work closely with the Oxley Creek Catchment Association and the volunteers in that area. On saying that, I would like to thank the board, especially Nigel, for his very capable chairmanship um, and keeping the local councillors involved. More importantly, I would like to thank the people of Brisbane um, and the people of the Oxley Creek for getting excited about this project. Because yes, it has been neglected for too long. It has taken this side, this administration, under the stewardship of Councillor um, Adrian Schrinner, Lord Mayor of Brisbane, to bring this project and push it forward and a massive investment. This side of the chamber is all about opening up more green space, protecting green space for future generations, opening them up so every single person of Brisbane can enjoy different leisure activities, whatever they like, whether they want to be on the water at this particular project or walk around or have a look at the natural wildlife that this area um, will give to the community of Brisbane. It is also working because we continuously checking the water quality in this area. And no wonder the water quality 
was poor at the time because a waste treatment plant doesn't do the best things for the, um, for the water quality. But we're continuously working on that to improve the quality of this um, waterway, which this project, I said was 150 hectares, 60 hectares of it will be let wetland conservation, which is a great asset to this community. Again, in closing, I'd like to thank Councillor Griffiths for his excitement for the project. I know your residents are absolutely going to love it. Um, and this is for the whole of Brisbane. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Johnson, you have a number of misrepresentations. Um, yes, four. You know, so I, on... I recall there's four, but please, please be succinct. Yes. Uh, firstly, the first point of misrepresentation by Councillor Hammond was apparently she said uh, that I said that there was no consultation. Um, so let me be clear, Mr Chairman, I actually referred directly to the consultation, quoting from the report provided to us to outline that there were nine written submissions and 144 surveys. Uh, so I certainly did not say there was no consultation as claimed by Councillor Hammond. The second point of misrepresentation, uh, Councillor Hammond said that I said um, that my ward would get no benefit. Um, this is a complete fabrication. I just did not say anything of that. That is a made-up statement by Councillor Hammond, who is living in fantasy land. The third there's, point there's of no misrepresentation. Need to just, just stick to the facts. No need to yep. Well, she's making things up in her head. Yep, nope. The third point of misrepresentation is uh, she claimed um, that I said that no one had spoken to her about this. I didn't say anything at all like that, at all. Um, let me be clear, I debated the motion before us today, which is about the Archerfield wetlands, and all of my discussion was about the Archerfield wetlands, yeah. and at all no right. point okay. did up. I Next ever one. say— Next one. At what? no point did I say that no one had spoken to me. Finally, Councillor Hammond said that I said that Ocker had not been consulted. In fact, in my speech today, I talked about the problem of placing too much emphasis on the local bush care groups to undertake all of the remediation works. I didn't mention OCA. Okay. Right. I didn't Th talk about you, consultation. Johnson. That Thank is you a for fabrication. Thank you the opportunity to, uh, to make those final statements. All right. Any further contributions? Uh, thank Councilor you, Mr Allen. Chair. I rise uh, briefly to speak on item B, contracts and tendering, and in particular, contract six, the communication and engagement services panel. I just wanted to bring a little bit of clarity to uh, what this panel is all about, what services they undertake and uh, perhaps allay some fears. Um, so Council undertakes community engagement to augment its decision-making processes and to ensure that decisions are made in the public interest. As part of Council's commitment to meaningful community engagement, appropriate resourcing is essential to ensure those affected by decisions have access to relevant information. So, um, to allay one of the concerns Councillor Cassidy raised, Council uses, wherever possible, internal resources to engage the community with many skilled and professional communication officers working as part of Council. And all of us in this chamber would have had opportunities to uh, engage with uh, CPO and their engagement team when working on local projects. However, Council has a diverse range of service requirements and it is sometimes necessary to engage additional resources or specialists to undertake engagement. The Communication and Engagement Services Panel enables Council officers access to resources and specialists to meet Council's community engagement needs. The panel is split into two categories, community engagement and project infrastructure. Community engagement suppliers may assist with master planning, open space and parks planning, community facilities upgrades and infrastructure, and citywide strategies and plans. Project infrastructure suppliers may assist with transport infrastructure projects, including roads, corridors, intersections and black spot upgrades, active transport infrastructure projects, including bikeways and cycle corridors, safe school travel, pedestrian paths and safety initiatives. Civic infrastructure projects including parks, boulevards, malls, pools and buildings are also included, along with waterways infrastructure and remediation projects including bridges, culverts, stormwater upgrades and harvesting and creek remediation. 
Prior to this uh, renewal, Council's average annual spend for the existing communication and engagement services panel, which finishes at the end of this month, was approximately $1 million per annum. This includes supply of qualified communication specialists for projects such as Brisbane Metro, Better Bikeways for Brisbane, road infrastructure projects such as Green Camp Road, Waterworks Road, Raymont Road and Grange Road intersection upgrades. It also includes our bus stop accessibility improvement program, the Stones Corner Precinct Hanlon Park project, Plan Your Brisbane, the Archerfield Wetlands Precinct Plan and Inogra Creek Sport and Recreation Precinct Plan. So all of these are important projects and high quality engagement is key. And this organisation, this administration is committed to high quality community engagement and the engagement of specialists support that objective. Thank you. Further speakers? There being none, Lord Mayor. I'll now put the resolutions A and C. All those in favour of A and C say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. On item B, all those in favour say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Division. Division. Division is called by Councillor Cassidy and Councillor Cook. Eyes to my right, nose to my left. Please ring the bells. Attendants, please close the bars. Clerks, please read the result. Mr Chair, the ayes have it, the voting being 18 in favour and five abstentions. The ayes have it, please return to your seats. Councillors, you can return to your seats now. Councillors, I draw your draw to your attention item six, the uh, decisions of the establishment co of the coordination committee. Uh, Lord Mayor. Mr. Point Chair, of order. Point of order to you, um, Councillor Johnston. Yes, I have a procedural issue I'd like to raise. Yes. With respect to item A. Yes. My understanding um, with respect to the issues at the beginning of the year is that um, the, any transactions relating to land um, must be um, approved by a full council decision. And that was discovered when we um, had all those leases uh, that weren't being handled properly. I note that ENC made a decision out of session, um, which we cannot uh, change today. Um, and I just ask whether or not, legally speaking, um, this matter should be for adoption rather than for information only. I don't have that 
information at hand. Lord Mayor, do you have further uh, Yeah, questions? just a bit of clarification. I understand yeah. that related to the disposal of land and disposal of assets as opposed to the purchasing of land. All right. Um, Point of order. Um, Point of order, this, Deputy Mayor. This, well, it is going to full council, but no, the disposal was done about leases, disposal, community facilities, and that has to definitely come to full council, but not the purchase of land or assets. Look, can I, just because of the environment we're in, I'm going to be really conservative in this. Uh, Councillor Johnson, can I ask that you move that that item be taken seriatim for debate and vote, and then we'll separate it out, and I'll get legal advice from the city legal officer, and then we'll come back. Does that work? Does that make sense? So we can continue, but just Th that's right. So what we'll do? Yes, we'll take a thank out, you. A out for Mr. Chair. I'm debate. happy. I'm happy to do that. I ask that item uh, A is taken seriatim for debate and voting purposes. Yep. So what I'll do, uh, yes, we'll make sure that that works from a uh, from a procedural point of view. But the Lord Mayor's got to move it, and then we'll accept that. Lord Mayor, please. Uh, Mr Chair, I move uh, that the report setting out the decisions of the Establishment and Coordination Committee as Delegate of Council during the Winter Recess 2019 on matters usually considered by that committee be noted, and I move that item A be taken as seriatim for debate and voting purposes. Seconded. Thank you. Um, so it's been moved by the Lord Mayor, seconded by the Deputy Mayor, the report uh, setting out the decisions of the Establishment Coordination Committee as Delegate of the Council during the Spring Recess 2019 on matters usually considered by that committee be noted and that item A will be taken um, for debate and voting separately and after. Uh, Lord Mayor, is there, is there any debate items B through E, please? Uh, yes, uh, item B is the Stores Board submission regarding enterprise storage. Uh, and this is a contract with EMC Holdings for their enterprise storage products and services. Council obviously relies on a large amount of electronic data uh, storage to conduct its business. For the past 10 years, Council has used EMC's enterprise storage products to store, access and retrieve this data. The data supports a key number of programs that Council uses, including SAP, DART, RIMS, GIS and Optimize. Council's existing contract is due to expire at the end of this month, 31st of October 2019. In order to ensure the continued management of Council's data, Council is pr proposing to enter into a contract directly with EMC for an additional five years. Obviously, we are um, happy with the service being provided and would like to continue it. Uh, directly contracting with EMC enables Council to secure the products and service services at a 4.5 per cent discounted rate uh, than compared to what we were offered under the previous contract. Uh, and we anticipate as we continue to move to a cloud-based system, Council's future expenditure under this contract will continue to reduce over time. Item C is the uh, lease for the new Brackenridge Library project and the partial surrender of reserve. Uh, the Brackenridge Library and community facilities are constructed on reserve. In order to undertake the project, an energy transformer is required. The upgrade has been considered within the overall project delivery. Discussions commenced with Energex last year with a view that an easement could be created for the transformer upgrade. Uh, the arrangement uh, noted is slightly different to retain existing trees on the site. Uh, this is just part of the load, larger project to upgrade the Brackenridge Library. The new library and ward office are being built in the former car park adjacent to the current facility and that project is now well underway. The project will, uh, is expected to be completed and officially open next month. Item D is the Stores Board submission for GIS systems or Geographical Information Systems. Uh, the Stores Board submission is to enter into a contract with Environmental Systems Research Institute, or ESRI, for geographical information systems. Council has been using this uh, system, uh, GIS, with ESRI for the last decade. The system provides us with integral mapping for a number of external and internal facing programs, including interactive mapping, flood mapping, uh, spatial open data, bris map, land activity and more. Over the past decade, Council has made significant investments in software implementation, upgrades and training to build our capability and improve Council's business. The software is considered market leading and is utilised by a number of local governments as well as Queensland government agencies. 
This Stores Board submission will enable Council to continue under the current corporate procurement arrangement for another nine years. Uh, item E is the Queensland Urban Utilities Draft Water Net Serve Plan, uh, the endorsement of planning assumptions. The uh, Net Serve Plan provides an overview of planning for the delivery of infrastructure for supplying QUU's water and wastewater services for at least 20 years. Uh, the plan is primarily a regulatory document for planning and development control. It applies to five participating local governments, being Brisbane, Ipswich, Lockyer, or Lockyer Valley, Scenic Rim, uh, and Somerset Regional Council. Under the South East Queensland Water Distribution and Retail Restructuring Act, QUU is required to review its water net serve plan every five years. The current plan uh, commenced in 2014 and is now being re reviewed. QUU requested council review and endorse the planning assumptions for the Brisbane local government area in the draft water net serve plan. The key components of the water net serve plan relevant to council's key review can be summarised as planning assumptions, proposed investments, connections process and connection area maps. The infrastructure team in city planning and economic development has reviewed the planning assumptions and liaised with QUU to resolve several inconsistencies in the data. QUU wrote to Council on 10th of September to provide an updated draft water net serve plan. The assumptions in the updated uh, water net serve plan are considered generally consistent with the planning assumptions in the city plan 2014. On this basis, uh, ENC, as a delegate of Council during the spring recess, uh, decided to endorse the planning assumptions uh, used in the QU draft water net serves plan as being consistent with the planning assumptions for Brisbane's local government area and appropriate uh, to, and, and sorry and approve the issuing of correspondence to that effect to QUU. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Chair. We support all these items. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, for that advice and for clarifying. Uh, this is the uh, item that I referred to in um, question time, uh, the first acquisition through the Green Future Fund, but it's also jointly funded through the Bushland Acquisition Program as well. Uh, and so there is uh, 1,082,500 uh, 1, being funded out of the Bushland Acquisition Fund and 2 million being funded from the Green Future Fund. We're expecting uh, the property to settle early next month and uh, believe it is a good positive outcome for uh, residents in that part of Brisbane. Yes, thank you. I'm just surprised there's not more speakers. Uh, I rise to speak on item A, which is the uh, acquisition of land at Sunnybank, I believe it is, and thank you for clarifying that uh, so we can debate the matter. Uh, firstly, I'd just like to say, um, not often have I uh, voted against um, other people's projects in their area. And I want to say that Councillor Mark should be contended, not often, um, Councillor Mark should be uh, congratulated for uh, pushing for land in her ward to be bought back. Um, it seems that this is a suitable area um, in that uh, it is, uh, well, I'm not sure if it's zoned actually, now I look at this. It said there was remnant bushland, but is it zoned in the high biodiversity area? Um, but anyway, I just want to say, I, I don't begrudge Councillor Marks for trying to have land in her ward bought back. However, what is an ongoing problem and it is now being replicated out of the bushland uh, preservation levy is 
that it is land in LNP Hill wards that are being prioritised for buyback purchase. So the Lord Mayor has made a big song and dance today about the fact that the first time um, that this uh, this $20 million fund is being um, used, uh, and it happens to be in an LNP ward. Now, I've been asking for years about the purchase of land in Oxley, um, and now I've been asking for several months about the purchase of land uh, in a different location in Oxley. That can't even get debated in this place because the Lord Mayor won't entertain a discussion. But an LNP councillor asks, they ask for land to be bought back, and it is fast-tracked through this place. That is political, that is not appropriate, and the same amount of effort should be put into purchasing back bushland in non-LNP wards, including my own. Uh, and I don't think it is appropriate um, that it is the LNP wards that are being uh, prioritised at the expense of significant remnant bushland in other areas. Uh, now, the other thing that I would like to express some concern about is this has been done uh, behind closed doors. Um, the Lord Mayor did not feel um, that the first time this fund was being used, it should come for debate uh, and voting in this place where we could actually uh, contribute to the process. He made the decision behind closed doors in the recess, and we have to accept this decision uh, because it is here for noting purposes only. Now, the fundamental problem with that is what is on page two of the report. Well, I'll start with page one, actually. Um, what this actually says is that $3 million has been set aside for the purchase of the land and an estimated disturbance cost of $82,500. So that would indicate that's the amount of expenditure that's been approved by ENC. But as we now know, um, it's probable that up to another million dollars, we don't know how much, but another million dollars of corporate overheads um, will be gouged out of this green fund to support this purchase. So my question to the Lord Mayor is, what other costs will you be deducting um, from the $20 million green fund? How will you publicly account for those? When will we be told what they are? And why have you delegated um, the decision to spend this money to the Chief Legal Counsel? If this council is approving um, the purchase of bushland uh, and ratepayers' funds in, in the millions of dollars, it should be very clear um, the terms, the conditions and the amount of funds that are being directed uh, towards that uh, purpose. And that is not clear on the information that we have before us today. And I don't want to find out in a few months' time that it really wasn't uh, $3.082 million, it was more like $4 million. Um, because suddenly there were marketing costs and suddenly there were extra legal costs and suddenly there was two lots of stamp duty and then suddenly there was corporate overheads, uh, car mileage, all those other things that you tacked on to Councillor Adams' special deal at Mount Gravatt. So what I would like to know is what are the actual and true costs of this purchase, um, where they will be accounted for, uh, will you be releasing a report detailing the expenditure of the $20 million? Uh, and I certainly don't think that these sorts of very large financial decisions should be made behind closed doors in the recess um, and leaving us here with no place uh, to debate or change the uh, amendment, uh, the motion if we wanted to. Thank you. Um, further speakers? Councillor Hammond. Thank you, Mr Chairman. I rise in support of item A and are extremely proud to be on this side of the chamber where we believe in buying green space for the future generations to enjoy. Our current, um, currently, our bushland um, acquisition program, we have 737 <coughs> hectares of land, which is up from the 722. We are well on target for the 750. In fact, we will exceed that target because on this side of the chamber, we are absolutely serious and passionate about our green space and adding it to the collection of publicly owned properties. Unfortunately, the councillor for Tennyson has nothing, neg has nothing positive to say about anything in this chamber, and it is disappointing that she is speaking so negatively about purchasing land for green space for our city. 
I am surprised at this one, Councillor Murphy, that she would be against the purchasing of green space for this city. Point of order, Mr Chairman. <clears throat> Point of order to you, Councillor Claim to be misrepresented. Been noted, and I will uh, call, it your, call on you at the end. Councillor Hammond, please continue. The Lord Mayor has explained to the Chamber in his, um, in his comments at the beginning of this of how much this land has cost, and using the Green Future Fund um, for the existing um, the piece of land there that we can open up to the community for actual green space and recreational space. This is bringing, giving the community more to see and do in their, in their suburbs, letting them be active in our community and getting in touch with nature, which it, the, this block of land connects beautifully to bushland and a bushland corridor for the Blimba Creek corridor. So I'd like to say the bushland acquisition, just in case some of the newer councillors and the councillor for Tennyson doesn't know, is voluntary. Bushland acquisition program is voluntary. There is a lot of people that we talk to across this city because, you know what, our hardworking council officers are just as passionate and share our Lord Mayor's um, vision for a cleaner, greener, sustainable city. But so you know, Councillor Cunningham, just in case you don't know, voluntary means we don't force them to sell it to us. It also means that we have private conversations which are protected by the privacy legislation. So I'm not going to stand up here and breach those good residents of Brisbane who we have been speaking to who don't want to sell their land to us because, do you know what, they enjoy their land. That is their castle. They want to continue to have that land. So, Mr Chair, it is disappointing that the councillor for Tennyson does not want green space for this city. It is disappointing. Point of order, Mr Chairman. Point of order, Councillor Johnston. Claim to be misrepresented again. I will again. add it to your already existing one. Councillor Hammond. Councillor Johnston was very clear that she didn't think this land should have been bought, which is an absolute shame. And do you know what? With that Point land... of order, Mr Chairman. Point of claim order. to be misrepresented again. Okay. Yeah, I don't think. Councillor Hammond. I'll, I'll leave that comment. The Green Future Fund is about opening up spaces for the residents of Brisbane. So yes, Councillor Johnson, we will go back into that area um, that we've bought for recreational areas through the Green Future Fund. Yes, we will. But no, no, no. Wait, wait one minute. Councillor Johnson just wants it. Well, does or does not want it bought, but does or does not want it actually developed into anything. So she's against opening it up, that open space that we've bought, to maybe some swings for those beautiful children we've point got. Point of order, Mr Chairman. Yep. Yeah, I, I can imagine what it's going to be, but I'll yeah. ask you, what is your point of order? Claim to be misrepresented. Right. Four, four. I've got four. All right. Councillor Hammond. Yes. So I dare say in the future, we will be spending money in that area to open it up as a parkland for our community to actually use. So that will be consultation. That will be consultation with Councillor Marks when she gets back from the local government association meeting. Um, and I look forward to actually giving the people of Brisbane more leisure opportunities across this city. I am disappointed again in closing that Councillor Johnson does not understand that the bushland preservation money is to buy privately owned properties, not publicly like she wants us to get, um, buy money from buy land from the state government because the state government, she's scared, she's scared they're of order, incompetent of looking after the, their land of order that to you, they Councillor own. Johnston. I am to be misrepresented. All right. Councillor Hammond. Because Councillor Johnson knows that the state government want to sell off that land because they want the profit. She is worried, absolutely concerned, that the state government are incapable of preserving that bushland. Incapable. Instead, we are investing the bushland preservation money and the Green Future Fund into buying more privately owned land that the residents of Brisbane can enjoy. And I'm proud, Mr Chair, that this Lord Mayor 
has a vision for this city to buy more land, to hold it in public ownership. And I support item A to the chamber. Councillor Johnston, you have a number of misrepresentations. Can I ask you in um, the name of sort of uh, good order that we be as as succinct as possible, please. I will try. There are five, Mr Chairman. The first comment by Councillor Hammond was, I was, a per I was against the purchase of green space in the city. I mean, um, I, I think I've stood up in the chamber week after week and in the, my own speech, minutes before hers, talked about the importance of buying back green space in the city, including at 67 Chapman Place, Oxley. And that's the second time today I've tried to have it debated. Can we just try second and, point, just, try and just, just like yep. to say succinct, please? Yep, that was succinct. Second point, um, Councillor Hammond said um, that I don't want green space in the city. Again, all evidence to the contrary. I've debated today very specifically the importance of purchasing back bushland, including at 67 uh, Chapman Place, Oxley. Point three, uh, Councillor Hammond said she, uh, that I said um, that I didn't think that the land should be purchased. Now, I did not say that. I actually said I didn't begrudge Councillor Marks um, purchasing the land, but my concern is that it is LNP wards yep, that are th getting prioritised, no, not you... LNP wards. Yep. Fourth four. point of misrepresentation. Uh, Councillor Hammond stood up and said um, that I was opposed to opening up and using the space for swings and playgrounds. Complete fabrication, not an issue I raised in my speech. So, you know, she's got her crystal ball yeah, and, out and there. Number five. Not something number that five, I said. Please. Five. Councillor Hammond said that I wanted land owned by the state government bought back. In my speech, Madam Chairman, I stated very clearly it's 67 um, Chapman look, uh, Place, Oxley, that's privately owned, Councillor and Johnson at no made. point did I raise any state government land at all. I, I don't mind being misgendered, but I, I am a man, um, and so I would prefer um, Mr Chairman in future. Um, all right, what I will do is, is, are there any further speakers? Councillor Cassidy. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, speaking on item A, obviously, uh, this purchase um, uh, of bushland at Chilton Street certainly on face value looks um, to be a lot better value um, for the ratepayers of Brisbane uh, than the $6.2 million spent on uh, land um, at uh, Carrara Street and Nurran Streets that didn't have a single tree on it. They had a few tennis courts, a few tennis courts there, uh, Mr Chair, uh, and a house and some gravel and a driveway and some concrete and rubble and things like that. Cocos some cocos palms, cocos, cocos palms. palms on that piece of land. This one, certainly, we've, we've had a look at that. Yeah, I don't, I've never, never seen a quail that eats cocos palms, but, um, uh, but this, this block, this block does seem to have, um, does seem to have um, uh, uh, bushland on it, at least, at least, uh, and for a two hectare block, this is $3 million, and for a 0 0.6 of a hectare block, uh, this administration spent $6.2 million. Uh, and it jumped up a million during the negotiations, that's right. And I think um, I share Councillor Johnston's um, uh, request for information here and question to the Lord Mayor about uh, what value uh, will be eaten up out of this $3 million in corporate overheads. Because we know uh, that the corporate overheads on that purchase, a $6.2 million purchase at Mount Cravat, was $750,000. $750,000, Chair. And when we uh, delved a little deeper and found out exactly what was included in those corporate costs, uh, we found out uh, that uh, things like corporate finance, support services, employee and payroll services, financial services, admin services, information services, branch, corporate comms, HR, procurement, revenue management, and some of the costs of city administration and governance, such as the CEO's office, ethical standards, assurance services, and a few other areas, such as carpools, fleet optimisation, etc., and a portion of council's legal services were included in those corporate overheads. So council was taking money out of the bushland money and paying other areas of council. So we saw, in that case, a 
three quarters of a million dollar transfer from, from bushland money to the CEO's office, to ethical standards, to uh, the carpool arrangements within council, to support services, corporate finance, corporate comms. We know this, paid, this money paid, probably paid for newsletters with uh, the Lord Mayor's face all over them. So while this on face value certainly looks like a better deal for the ratepayers of Brisbane, we have serious concerns around the way in which this administration is misusing money in the bushland fund or this green fund, which is intended specifically, specifically for um, purchasing bushland, purchasing environmental land, and is being used for all these other things. So, while it looks good on face value, we would certainly want some more information from the Lord Mayor Chair. Further speakers, Councillor yes. Griffiths. Oh yes, I couldn't resist uh, the opportunity to say something about this. Um, the sheer, um, the sheer rotting that has been going on with the bushland fund is unbelievable under this administration. It is unbelievable. And, Point of uh, order, Mr Chair. Point of order. This order. is not the bushland acquisition levy. This is actually the city green fund. Oops. My recollection was from the Lord Mayor's presentation that this land was purchased through two funds. Yes. yes. And um, for, so for the, um, hasn't read the papers, obviously. For the, um, I, will, I will allow, I will allow um, uh, the uh, discussion around bushland acquisition to continue. However, I would ask that we keep our language proportionate and appropriate. Point of order, Mr. Definitely. Chair, and I ask that we keep it to the addresses that are actually listed in the report. We haven't for the whole debate. It's interesting. The debate I'm, has been going. I'm not going sure on. if I can. The problem is, um, Deputy Mayor, I've allowed other people to make comment about oh. the bushland up acquisition, um, so I will uh, allow Councillor Griffiths to do so. Yeah. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Chair. It's a reasonable decision. Um, uh, what we believe, with regards to um, to the bushland fund and this new fund that has suddenly appeared, is that it should be independently assessed. Uh, assessed at some distance from LNP councillors and from, frankly, LNP staff uh, who shouldn't be involved in any of the assessment process in relation to this. We have great concerns about how these, how these um, blocks of land are chosen. And it's interesting to hear today. Point of order. Point of order. I believe the councillor is imputing motive. Uh, look, I, I don't take objection to it. You know, Councillor Griffiths, please continue. It seems anything you say can be imputing motive. Living is imputing motive under these people. Um, you know, um, can you? Uh, uh, I will come back I, to I the point. I made a ruling in your favour. Please, <laughs> yes, please accept thank it. You. I'm just, just making a point that living seems to be a problem for them. Um, what I would like to say is this seems to fit the basic and fundamental criteria of purchasing land and that is it's in an LMP ward. And we know that because we've done the figures and the Australians done the figures and Corey and Mail have done the figures on how much has been spent of bushland funding and it's predominantly over $70 million in four years has been spent in LMP wards. And a very insignificant amount has been spent in wards represented by anyone other than the LNP. It is interesting that we're going in and we're purchasing this property because it's come up on the market. So we're jumping in to save this land from development, it's privately owned land to save it from development, but we weren't able to do that with the land at 67 Chapman Place which is privately owned land undergoing development that is environmentally significant and that has been on the list for a number of years because I've written to the mayor previously, the previous mayor, who actually wrote back to me and said, yes, we'd be interested in buying that land. They've just never done it. Once again, it's not in an LMP ward. I am concerned about how much money has been spent by the LNP and particularly in Councillor Adams area, Councillor Adams area where three house blocks are bought for $6.2 million. And that land was up for development, totally cleared, but up for development. 
not connected to any other corridors around the place, but that was what we spent $6.2 million of bushland funding on. And in fact, the whole of Australia was interested when they read it in the Courier Mail or the Australian. The Australian. Because of the dodginess of the way we are purchasing bushland under this administration. And we're going to keep talking about this and talking about can, it and talking Councilor about Griffiths, it. Councillor Griffiths, can I just ask you, you you've, you've been going for a little while now. Um, the bulk of the presentation has been on a site that isn't 97 Chilton Street. So can I just ask you to I'll come, come back? I will come back to it. I'll so come back to it. So you've spent three minutes of your three and a half minutes on not Sunnybank Hills. So can I just ask you to come back, Let me please? talk about Sunnybank Hills. Let me talk about this land, which is an LMP electorate and which has been purchased like that brought to this chamber like that, but other sites in the city aren't brought to the chamber. There is no scientific, no independent assessment of the site. It is just happens to, this is land that's come up for sale and we'll just buy it. This is our concern with the bushland levy. This is our concern with the misuse of ratepayer funding. We're concerned about the rorting that's going on here, and we still, even with blocks like this, even with the way the price has jumped in value, we remain concerned about the way council and this administration is going about purchasing of green space in the city. And I believe there'll be more to come on this story um, in time as it gets investigated further. Thank you. Further speakers? There being none, I will just take a quick moment. As uh, when I read the legal advice earlier in the meeting, it has, was drawn to my attention that my microphone was off. So I will now read it again for the purposes of completeness of the record. The advice was that the purchase of land can be done by the Establishment and Coordination Committee as delegate uh, in recess. Matters which relate to the disposal of land must go to full council, for example, lease or sale of land. So that was what I read earlier, but I just want to make sure that that was included in the full transcript. All right, on item A, or, uh, Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor. Thank you, Mr Chair. Uh, it is quite extraordinary uh, to hear the position of opposition councillors on the acquisition of land, whether it's parkland or bushland. Really quite extraordinary. Um, on the one hand, these are people who always jump to the f defence of the Labor state government when they're selling off bushland always jump to their defence when it comes to selling off bushland, yet they criticise us for buying land. They criticise us for creating new parks. They criticise us for buying bushland from private ownership and creating new conservation reserves. We're spending too much money on this, apparently. We are spending way too much money on buying land and creating new parks and bushland reserves. It's an extraordinary argument. Extraordinary. It's almost like their argument on Metro, where we're moving too quickly on Metro, uh, where we need to slow down. We're moving too fast on Metro. So the reality is we will continue to buy land for the benefit of the public. This is not for some kind of private benefit. This is for public benefit here. And when you hear uh, Labor councillors saying, oh, they're all in LMP wards, well, I predict that well over 70 per cent of acquisitions will be in LMP wards, because we hold well over 70 per cent of wards. But more importantly, well, more importantly, most of the bushland in the city is in LMP wards, because ultimately those people know that we care about bushland and they support our efforts to protect bushland and create new parkland. And people in LMP wards are generally happier with life because they know that we support the great things that create the lifestyle our city has, the parks and the green space that make those suburbs so livable. Uh, of course, of course, uh, they are going to go into uh, LMP wards because we hold more than 70 per cent of the wards and we hold the majority of bushland wards as well. And so uh, you don't see uh, inner city wards um, coming up for bushland acquisition. Uh, because we have primarily purchased all of the bushland in those wards uh, long ago. Uh, but uh, in, in, to, to give Councillor Johnson some comfort, 
uh, she has put forward some suggestions for the Green Future Fund, and they are being considered. So um, we may have some good news for you. Uh, and I look forward to your support of that good news rather than attacking and criticism. Um, that we can do something for a change. <laughs> we'll take you up on that. Uh, but uh, yeah, we are considering them. And, and you know, if Labor councillors want to put up good suggestions as well that doesn't involve buying state government land, we're happy to consider those suggestions. So uh, we are very proud of our record when it comes to purchasing land for parks and for bushland. Uh, and we're not ashamed to say that they're spending records amounts on that investment. And uh, we just find Labor's argument or the opposition's argument quite extraordinary that they claim we're spending too much money on buying new parks and bushland. Uh, there, this, is, this is an issue that if you go out and ask the members of the community should we be spending more or less money on buying parks and bushland? I think I know what the answer would be. Yes. Uh, so it, it's just really quite extraordinary. But it, it is certainly consistent though with Labor's approach today, where they have consistently decided to take uh, positions that the majority of the public wouldn't take. Uh, they took those positions earlier today and they are now again taking positions where they are attacking what is a really positive thing. Uh, but, uh, Mr Chair, we will not be deterred from uh, doing the right thing, buying up land for bushland and parks, and I commend this item to the Chamber. All right, councillors, all those who support item A, say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have Division, it. division. Okay. There is a division called by Councillor Adams and Councillor Hammond. Eyes to my right, nose to my left. Please ring the bells. Tenants, please close the bars. Clerks, please read the result. Mr Chair, the ayes have it, the voting being 24 in favour. The ayes have it, please return to your seats. Councillors, item six. The Establishment and Coordination Committee Special Report. Mr Chair, I move that the special report of the Establishment and Coordination Committee meeting held on Monday, 14th of October 2019 be adopted. Seconded. It's been moved by the Lord Mayor, seconded by the Deputy Mayor, that the special report of the Establishment and Coordination Committee meeting dated Monday the 14th of October 2019 excuse me, be adopted. Is there any debate? Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. Obviously, uh, these uh, are changes to the membership of council's standing committees, including a change to civic cabinet as well. Uh, as of yesterday, Councillor Cooper, or former Councillor Cooper, uh, resigned her position, uh, and uh, this has created a vacancy both in council and also uh, in cabinet. And so uh, what we have here is um, a appointment of Councillor McLaughlin to replace Councillor Cooper in Civic Cabinet. And we also have some changes to committees, in particular changes that relate to uh, the leader and deputy leader of the opposition, uh, changes that have been put forward by the opposition as well. I did want to take this opportunity though to thank Councillor Cooper, well, thank Amanda Cooper um, for her uh, many long years of service to the city of Brisbane. Uh, she was uh, she came into this place in 2007 and uh, it was only one year later that she became a member of Civic Cabinet uh, and she served at a senior role ever since then uh, to, to do incredible things uh, in important portfolios for the people of Brisbane. But also uh, she was continually re-elected as well by her residents in Bracken Ridge Ward 
and she was a, a definitely a much loved local councillor and one that uh, many people would say uh, is holding an area that may not always uh, be a LMP kind of area. Uh, so she worked very hard for her community. Uh, she was very active in her community, but she was also an important senior member of this team and a member of cabinet uh, since 2008. So uh, well over a decade in cabinet, she was, I understand, one of uh, well, certainly from our side, the longest serving chair of uh, the Neighbourhood Planning uh, Committee, uh, and then followed that up with uh, her work in infrastructure as well, uh, a matter which she was, uh, or a portfolio which she was always uh, and also very passionate about. Uh, she delivered many important projects uh, when it comes to the infrastructure portfolio, but particularly I know she was very proud of the incredibly successful uh, Telegraph Road upgrade, um, which uh, has been a game changer in that part of Brisbane and one that has been uh, very well received by local residents. But she was also a champion uh, for local facility upgrades. And uh, there's one that we talked about earlier today in council. Uh, unfortunately, she won't be the councillor when it's completed, uh, which is the library uh, upgrade. But also uh, assets like the fantastic pool and the BMX track which is just uh, an incredible asset for the city and much loved by her residents. So we certainly wish Councillor Cooper all the best for the future. Um, and while she certainly can't comment on her future at this point in time, I can. <laughs> and I think the future is very bright. Uh, and I think uh, my message to um, the member for Aspley, <laughs> Amanda's coming for you. <laughs> Uh, and she will be a fantastic member for Aspley, um, committed to representing the residents of that area in the state parliament. And it'll be nice to have someone in state parliament uh, that you know is is actually committed to those residents uh, as opposed to committed to their Labor Party colleagues. And so Councillor Cooper or Amanda Cooper will do a fantastic job, no doubt, uh, in that role. And she has a bright future ahead of her. But I do thank her for. Uh, her service in this place, uh, and uh, it was really an incredible career in council that she has had, but I think the best is yet to come. I would also like to welcome uh, Councillor McLaughlin back into Cabinet. Uh, he uh, notified me as soon as I became Lord Mayor that he was having an operation on his foot, um, and he uh, offered to uh, step down, or wanted to step down from Civic Cabinet at that point. Um, he has had that operation, he's been limping around, but now he is ready to kick butt. So his foot is better and he's, he's back in the chair, back in the, um, in the cabinet, ready to do some good things. Uh, and like Councillor Cooper, or Amanda Cooper, uh, Councillor McLaughlin is one of the most experienced members in the team. Uh, and I think uh, you came in straight after me, didn't you? So um, 2006? Yeah, so uh, he's the second longest serving member of our team after myself, uh, having been uh, having uh, come into the role in 2006. And I distinctly remember that by-election uh, with Labor's interesting campaign and their plastic wrap that they put everywhere. Um, but uh, Councillor McLaughlin, I know, will do a great job in the infrastructure portfolio. And he's very passionate about getting Kingston Smith Drive done and dusted, uh, and uh, <laughs> he's he's got a he's got a vested interest in making sure it happens uh, as quickly as possible. And so he'll be driving the contractor to perform to their limits and the maximum ability. Uh, and I know he'll be working on behalf of the city and on behalf of his residents as well to make that project, but also many other important infrastructure projects happen. Uh, Councillor McLaughlin is particularly excited by the opportunity to start rolling out the $500 million uh, Better Roads for Brisbane program, which we just announced with the federal government. So a investment of equal proportions from both the federal government and council, targeting a dozen upgrades around the city, uh, making sure we get those federal funds flowing into our community, matched with council funds uh, and seeing upgrades rolling out. Uh, we will start to see the commercial and Doggett Road upgrade uh, kicking off first, uh, hopefully early next year, 
uh, and then progressively we will see more and more of those uh, upgrades rolling out as consultation is done and the planning work is done. And uh, Councillor McLaughlin is champing at the bit uh, to get into those and, as I said, to kick some butt. So uh, welcome back, Councillor McLaughlin, and um, hopefully your time on the bench has been restful and you're ready for some really hard work over the next few months. Further speakers? Uh, Councillor Richards. Uh, Mr Chair, as it's 7.03, I move that Council now adjourn for dinner for a period of one hour, which commences only when all councillors have vacated the chamber and the doors have been locked. Seconded. Uh, it's been moved by Councillor Richards, seconded by the Deputy Mayor, that this Council now adjourn for a period of one hour for the purpose of dinner, which, uh, which commences when all councillors have vacated the chamber and the doors have been locked. All those in favour say aye. Aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it.